are no uh, public questions or we do not take any public testimony during briefing, uh, only during hearing. Uh, welcome to our presenters who are in the waiting room. A reminder, uh, when you're led into the waiting room and beginning your presentation, please clear, clearly describe which slide you are presenting to in order to assist those who may be participating via audio. On today's agenda, we have four items for briefing. I'll read through all four. Item A is DCP ZDR 2021-04751, address 4339 Lytle Street, new construction for Mill 19 Phase C, Hazelwood neighborhood. Item B is DCP ZDR 2021-05546, address 100 Tech Street, demolition, renovation, and new construction for a health, wellness, and athletic center, Skibo Hall, in the Squirrel Hill North neighborhood. Item C is DCP ZDR 2019-00563, address 3112 Smallman Street, new construction for a multi-unit residential building in the Strip District neighborhood. And item D is DCP ZDR 2021-06286, 3401 Bates Street, demolition of multiple properties in the Oakland public realm, central Oakland neighborhood. Before I, uh, we, before we start the first case, I do wanna do a um, sound check for our commissioner. So, and I, I see some others have joined us. Great, welcome. Uh, when I read your name, please uh, unmute yourself and let us know that you're here. Commissioner Askey. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Blackwell. Okay, Commissioner Brown. Nope. Okay, uh, Commissioner Burton Falk. Isn't. Thank you, Commissioner Dietrich. Here. Uh, Commissioner Dick. Here. Thank you, Commissioner Mingo. Present. Uh, Commissioner Mondor here. Commissioner O'Neill. Here. Okay, great. Okay, so let's go back to our items. Item A today is DCP ZDR twenty twenty one zero four. 751, address 4339 Lytle Street, new construction for Mill 19 Phase C in the Hazelwood neighborhood. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, this is a final land development plan application for new construction of a three-story, 95,000 gross square foot structure for use as office and laboratory research spaces. Uh, the application is located in specially planned District 10, Hazelwood Green, and has been reviewed per the PLDP, the Preliminary Land Development Plan, adopted in July of 2018. The address is identified as Block 19, located in the Mill District, and is the third phase of development within the Mill 19 structure. Uh, Mill 19 is noted as a legacy block in the PLDP. The application has also been reviewed for plan compliance with the adopted Greater Hazelwood Neighborhood Plan. That review is attached to your report. Uh, the stormwater management plan has been submitted and is currently under review. A transportation impact study is not required for this application. A trip allotment analysis has been submitted and approved by the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure. Uh, the proposed project was reviewed by staff design review on May 17, 2021, uh, and um, the con contextual design advisory panel review was not required. Uh, the design review summary letter is attached to your report as well. A uh, development activities meeting was held on June 8, 2021 by the Hazelwood Initiative, the registered community organization for this location. The DAM summary report is also attached. Um, at this time, I will turn it over to the applicant for a sound check. Testing, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Great. So my name is Donald Johnson spelled D-O-N-A-L-D-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. And I represent RIDC, which stands for the Regional Industrial Development Corporation. Uh, and we are a private nonprofit economic development organization. You can go to the next slide, please. So this is just a project summary slide. Oh, back one, please. 
Um, so as stated, it was mill 19 phase C. So this is the third project. Um, the owner is RIDC and the project is being developed um, general office lab and research. And it's approximately 96,000 square feet in three floors. Um, so the third phase of the adaptive reuse of the former Jones and Laughlin mill 19 building at Hazelwood Green. And like the previous two phases, it is a new speculative for rent office building that is being built underneath the existing steel skeleton of the mill 19 building. Next slide, please. Um, a, an overall site plan is shown currently. And what we're showing is that um, there were three total phases in mill 19. Phase A is in the southernmost portion of the building. Phase B was in the center. And this phase C is in the northernmost portion of the building. Um, all around the building is um, still undeveloped site at Hazelwood Green, with the exception of the newly opened Hazelwood Green Plaza that just opened in May at the very southernmost portion of the Mill 19 building. And the building fronts on Lytle Street, which is a newly publicly adopted um, street. And to the north of the building is the new street called Beehive. Next slide, please. Um, zooming into an enlarged site plan for phase C, um, you can see that the main entry is directly off of Lytle Street, that new street that we previously talked about, um, about center line of the building. And uh, there are existing street trees, which are going to remain on Lytle Street, about 14 street trees. Um, there is a shared way to the uh, west, no, sorry, east of the building, so plan north, um, which is where loading and service would be accessing the building. Next slide, please. And now we're just looking at some existing contest, context for the site. Uh, currently shown on the screen is the existing mill 19, existing steel skeleton with mill 19A closest to the viewer and mill 19B more to the left in the center of the building and mill 19C would be furthest away from us when it was would eventually be built. Um, I should also note that this photo does not show the installation of a two megawatt photovoltaic uh, solar PV array, which was installed and finished last year. Next slide, please. And then an overall aerial shot showing the mill 19 structure with the PV array installed and in the foreground, the newly opened Hazelwood Green Plaza, which was opened in May. Next slide, please. And then this is a shot that shows underneath the existing skeleton of the mill 19 building showing the southernmost portion of the Mill 19 Phase A project. So again, showing context. Um, and I just wanted to note that the Phase C building would really be a continuation of themes that we saw previously in Phase A and Phase B. Next slide, please. So the, the, the current slide shows what is called the loggia um, which is a portion on the river side of the building that is publicly accessible outdoor space outside of the two new buildings, but still underneath the existing steel skeleton. And that is a landscaped area that has amenities, benches, walkways, um, and also some um, kind of fun elements such as these I-beam swings, which were um, using recycled I-beams from the existing building and then hanging them from chains from the existing structure so that they could be used as swings. Next slide. And here we have um, an ex the first exterior rendering, rendering of the new building, uh, phase C, looking at it from the north corner um, from Lytle Street and Beehive Street, um, showing that it is a continuation of A and B in terms of the design themes with a first floor um, delineated from um, a larger second and third floor um, um, section. Next slide. And then here we have another view from the same vantage point, but this time the 
existing skeleton is rendered in with the building and the surrounding landscape that is planned. Next slide. And here is a rendered view of what the main entry off Lytle Street would look like. Next slide. And now we have the elevation drawings themselves. So this is the west elevation, which is the view from the river side. Next slide. And this is the east elevation, which is along the shared way, which is where the service access would be. Next slide. And then finally, we have views of the building on the north side and the south side, which are the two short elevations. Next slide. And then finally, some rendered views of what those elevations would look like, both of Mill 19C from the riverside on the top, and then on the bottom, an overall rendered elevation of what the entire Mill 19 building would look like with phase A and B and a completed phase C. Next slide, please. And here we have a slide of the landscape features shown in axonometric, a, a rendered drawing that um, shows some of the features that we will have, and I'll list some of these features. Um, there's a carbon garden, which is basically a, a garden that uses aspens, um, which is a, a tree that does very, very well in terms of carbon sequestration. So we're planning on planting those to try to um, capture some carbon. Uh, there's the north porch, which is at the northernmost part of the building underneath the existing frame, which sort of mirrors what is going on on the opposite end of the building, where, what we did with Mill 19A with the south porch. Um, and then we have an artifact garden, number three, which is an area where we will actually be placing um, artifacts that were discovered during the um, demolition of the building, placing those artifacts in the landscape amongst the plantings so that people can experience them. Um, and then I won't list, I won't go through the rest of them, but uh, it's a very extensive landscape program. And then we show a rendering in the, the lower right corner that shows what a large gathering space within the landscape would look like. Next slide, please. So here we have a, a landscaping plan of the building and just wanted to note that this shows all of the, the tree species that are planned to be used, um, such as the aforementioned aspens. We're also using river birch, uh, we're using some black locust and we're using some staghorn um, sumac, which are all tree species that we've used on the previous A and B phases for the, the project. Next slide. The, the, the slide that's currently shown is the landscape plan materials plan. And what I want to note here is that there is a large use of recycled concrete, which is used directly from the existing slab of the Mill 19 building that was demolished and then stored on site. Next slide, please. And then for the site furnishings plan, um, I just wanted to point out the location of uh, the bike racks, which are denoted with F11 typical. Um, you can see, I don't know if I can use a pointer, if you can see that, but um, just to the left of the main, where the main entrance is sort of at the center of the plan. And then again, at the southernmost portion of the building. Next slide, please. And then in, ter in terms of the overall bike storage, there is an internal protected bike storage room uh, that has a capacity for 20 bikes. And we have two different bicycle racks that are being specified for that so that we can accommodate different user types. So we have the Darrow Ultra, which is a bike rack where you have to lift the bike in order to mount it. And then we have a Darrow Campus rack, which is just a floor mounted rack. So you can just roll your bike right directly into it without having to lift your bike. Um, and then we're using the same bike rack that we used in phase A and B, um, which is the Forms Campus bike rack. Uh, so all in total with the 20 interior bike parking spaces and then the 18 exterior bike parking spaces, we have 38 total 
bicycle parking spaces. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a slide of the roof plan that shows the location of the rooftop dedicated outside air unit. Um, we have switched from a, a traditional air handling unit scheme to a BRF system. So we only have one large air handling unit on the roof at this point. Next slide, please. And the air handling unit is mounted. Um, uh, so this slide shows a, a 3D rendering of the building showing the air handling unit from a uh, ground perspective. And the air handling unit is uh, placed 11 feet back from the facade, and then the existing structure of the Mill 19 steel skeleton actually shields the air handling unit from view. Next slide, please. This slide shows the, a plan of the trash and transformer screening. So the, the trash and the transformers are accessed off the back of the building, off of the shared, shared way. And we will be using a similar screening strategy that we developed for phase A and B. And I show a picture of those as they were built out for phase A. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide is the exterior material sample. Uh, so we're using a um, variety of materials that we've seen on the previous A and B phases, such as metal panel, both in terms of flat and a box ribbed um, sort of variation. So that has some, some shadow play on it. We're using some aluminum, aluminum composite panel and a metal panel accent. Um, the color is still um, yet to be finalized, but we're thinking that it will probably be an aquarium teal to give a little bit of uh, color pop. Um, amongst the existing steel skeleton. And then again, we're using steel plate fins around the windows, um, blackened mullions, glass, and then the stairs and walkways will be painted in the same um, bright yellow paint that is on the previous two phases. Next slide, please. And this slide just calls out how those proposed materials were used on the previous two phases um, you know, glass, metal panel, the box rib, the ACM panel, the mullions, the steel plate fins, um, and the paint, the yellow painted steel. Next slide, please. The construction management plan is showing, um, and just in terms of an overall summary, no uh, rerouting of public transportation is anticipated for the construction of the project. A partial closure of Beehive Street and part of its sidewalk will be required only during excavation steel erection and the enclosure construction. Um, no street closures are anticipated for Lytle Street, which is where the main entrance for the building is. A partial closure of the privately owned shared way on the east side, so that service drive will be required for the duration of the construction. Subcontractors will be parking off-site um, at another lot owned by RIDC, which was used for contractor parking during the phase A and B construction. Um, and the site will be fenced and protected from the public. There will be a mobile crane, uh, which will be within the site fence uh, throughout the duration of the construction. And construction should be from October, 2021 until November, 2022. Um, and all rerouting of pedestrians will of course um, maintain ADA accessibility on sidewalks and walkways. Next slide, please. The accessibility and universal design summary. All, ex all Mill 19 C interior and exterior spaces are designed to be fully accessible. Just wanted to note that. Next slide, please. And the sustainability and stormwater management plan summary, the building will meet a minimum of lead core and shell gold rating. Um, the P4 measures will be documented um, during the design and construction of the project. And REDC has already pledged the, mil the entire Mill 19 campus to the Pittsburgh 2030 district. Um, and just some of the sustainable features are all electric HVAC for zero carbon combustion on site. Up to 50% of the building's power will come from the on-site solar PV array. Lead EQ enhanced indoor air quality. Um, enhanced commissioning, use of native vegetation, 33% um, indoor water reuse reduction. And then in terms of the stormwater plan summary, the project meets the Pittsburgh stormwater requirements. Um, 
we're restoring 15% of the previously developed Mill 19C site um, with native and adaptive plants. And the project does not require revisions to the existing PA, DP, and DPES permit. Uh, the Mill 19 site includes a quarter acre rainwater infiltration garden and the planned development reduces all existing peak flows and volumes. Next slide, please. Just wanted to give a, a brief summary of the public art plan. Um, the landscape architects 10 by 10, who are also the landscape architects that, that worked with us for phase A and phase B, um, are partnered with Hazelwood artist and resident Edith Aveda to collaborate on a community-based public art selection process for Mill 19C. And together, the group will create a short list of interested regional and community artists for collaborative selection process. Um, through two community workshops, the community will select the artists and locate the artworks within the Mill 19C site. And the community will be asked to consider integrating different types of art into the project and to select the direction they feel best speaks to them and that suits the project. Collaboration between the artists and community is encouraged, though ultimately dependent on the artists selected by the community. The design team will work with the artists uh, to successfully integrate the art into the landscape. And though the art will be located on private property, um, the art's location will allow it to be experienced by the general public. And the placement of the art will allow it to be fully accessible in terms of accessibility and universal design. Okay, next slide. So this slide is about the community process summary. <clears throat> and on uh, May 8th, when the Hazelwood Green Plaza opened, RIDC staffed a tent that had renderings and plans for the building um, to explain the project to interested community members who were at the event. Um, and then the, the community was also encouraged to tour the exterior of the existing phase A and B projects. Uh, June 8th, we had the development advisory meeting, uh, which was already spoken about. And then tonight um, at Hazelwood Initiatives meeting is when we introduce the public art plan. Um, so this is just the introduction, introduction of the public art plan. This is not one of the, the workshops. The first workshop is scheduled for August 4th and is scheduled to take place at Mill 19. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a slide that is an update on the Hazelwood Green Urban Open Spaces, um, which is a requirement of the PLDP. And I just want to highlight um, the PLDP has a chart of, of all the existing urban open spaces that are planned to, to be developed over time on the 178 acre site. And I just want to highlight changes to three of those blocks Urban open space one, the phase A trail along Blair Street was open in 2019 since this PLDP was published. Um, and, the, and then update number two in urban open space number three, the phase A of urban space open space, urban open space number three was completed and open as, as of the PLDP writing. Um, and then most recently in urban open space number six, which is the Hazelwood Grand Plaza, again, that was open in May of this year. And with the completion of those three projects at Hazelwood Green, <clears throat> excuse me, um, all the, the combined 4.7 acre, um, acres of urban open space that this entails um, allows for the um, ongoing development of the mill district. Next slide. And that concludes the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, we take no public testimony. Are there questions or comments by the commission? I have a couple um, quick questions. Um, so, you know, I actually really enjoy this project. I've been wandering around the spaces. Um, so one of my questions though, is sort of about where the general public can walk and where they can't walk. So it seems to me like a lot of the yellow stairs in the other two phases are closed off for people or are they just gated? Um, so can you just sort of tell me where can the general public go? And then how do the people who are occupying the space, do they have to go inside the building and take the elevators and they can only leave by the stairs or can they actually use the stairs to get into the building? Um, so first question, um, the general public can access all the exterior elements of the building on the ground plane. 
Um, at, during special events, we do open up the staircases and, and some of the overlooks and balconies and things like that with tenant permission. Um, the um, exterior stairs are gated, but they're not locked. And then the tenants have access to the building and they go up to their floors either by the elevator or internal communicating stairs. Um, and then a lot of them actually come and go using the exterior stairs because it's a more direct route. Uh, the exterior stairs are actually part of the egress plan for the building. So they are actually the fire stairs. Okay, that's it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Okay, thank you for our thorough presentation and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Our next item is DCP ZDR 2021-05546, address 100 Tech Street, demolition, renovation, and new construction for Health, Wellness, and Athletic Center, Skibo Hall in the Squirrel Hill North neighborhood. And that is Mr. Kunak again. Hello. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, this is a project development plan for partial demolition and new construction of approximately 160,000 gross square feet of a health, wellness, and athletic center building. The application is located in an educational, medical, and institutional zoning district and reviewed per the institutional master plan adopted in 2012 um, and, amendment, and amended in 2019. The site is identified as um, project eight in the 10 year development envelope. Uh, the application includes a minor amendment to the IMP. Um, the required north and west setback is 15 feet, a reduced west setback along Tech Street at the entry vestibule and lobby is requested and will be um, reviewed in the presentation. Uh, there are no requests to the Zoning Board of Adjustment as part of this project. Uh, the stormwater management plan has been submitted and is under review. Uh, a transportation meadow, memo has been submitted and is under review by the Department of, Mobi of Mobility and Infrastructure. And a development activities meeting was held virtually on May 5th, 2021 with the Squirrel Hill Urban Coalition, the registered community organization for this location. That summary report is attached. Um, at this time, I will turn it over to the applicants and I will quickly note that, you know, we are having a slightly longer delay than normal in between slides. So please be patient. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And thank you, commissioners. It's good to be back in front of everybody. Can you guys all hear me okay? Well, good we afternoon. Can. I'm Bob Reppy. I'm the Director of Planning and Design with Carnegie Mellon University. I'm super excited and pleased to be here today to talk to you guys about our new health, wellness, and athletic center proposal, which will be taking place at the Skibo gym site in the southeast corner of campus, uh, as shown here on the title slide. Uh, the, the historic gym uh, is, is was built, uh, was originally designed by Henry Hornball, so the original architect for campus. Um, and, we, uh, and this is a proposal that we're excited to bring forward, uh, thanks to the generosity of a lead gift from the Highmark Foundation. Or corporation. So if we can go to the first, the next slide, please, Kevin. So what we're proposing here is actually what we think is a relatively innovative and new idea for uh, student health on campus. It's a combination of not just an athletic center, which will be bringing up to contemporary standards, our university's athletic department uh, for both intercollegiate and intramural athletics, but it'll also be bringing under one roof, three other organizations, universities, universal, university health services, which is the kind of physical health where you go get your flu shots, et cetera. University's CAPS group, which stands for the Counseling and Psychological Services, and the university's new wellness center, an expanded group, uh, which is becoming in here, become the kind of focal point and the distribution point for all the, for anybody that is coming to this building <clears throat> for support uh, for either your mental health, physical health, well being, et cetera. I think this is a really exciting idea where you're combining all of these ideas uh, under one roof. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, just as an overview of dates, we can touch back on these uh, at the end. Uh, we've, we've been working on this for a little over a year now, We're working with our team of BCJ and Langen and uh, OG, OGB from our landscape design team, uh, where we are today is presenting with for the, for the planning commission review 
Ultimately, our goal is to start uh, demolition later this summer, which with construction that will go through until summer of 2024. Uh, next slide, please, Kevin. So as I noted, the site is located in the southeast corner of the uh, of our campus, uh, kind of right up next to uh, the Shunley, it's just north of Shunley Park, uh, right at the corner of uh, Margaret Morrison Street and Tech Street. Right immediately to the east is the Park Mansions uh, Condo Association, which is uh, a larger tall building we'll see here in a moment. The, the entire site of the proposed project is zoned EMI. Next slide, please. As Kevin noted, it is a project that was approved, that's identified in our approved institutional master plan. And with the exception of two very minor setbacks that I'll touch about, touch on about uh, here in a little bit, uh, does meet all of the standards of the institutional master plan. Next slide, please. These are just some images, quick images to kind of give an idea of the context. This building is super exciting for the university. We're really excited about it, what it means. It's also really important because of the context that's around them. Obviously, uh, the park mansions as seen in that middle image kind of uh, hovers over, loomed over the site as uh, not only is it a large, taller building, but it also is uphill from campus. Uh, immediately across the street to the west, we have the Hall of Arts, which used to be called, also known as the uh, Graduate School of Industrial Administration, as well as Posner Hall. Uh, a post uh, post war modernist building and a post modern building uh, kind of were linked together, and then of course immediately to the north is one of our most iconic buildings, Margaret Morrison Carnegie Hall. And so the idea is how does this building work within the context? Kent's going to talk about that in a few moments, but it really is a lot of these kind of major contextual issues that we looked at in the design of the building. You can go to the next slide, please. Here's some images of the site. Uh, the site for Carnegie Mellon is not flat. It is probably our, one of our most hilly sites. There's about a 40-foot drop going north-south across the site. There's also a drop going east-west, as shown on the bottom slide as well, of about 15 to 20 feet, depending on where you are, that goes across uh, laterally across the site. What this means, however, it gives us real opportunity to have a building that is we're actually significantly adding mass to this building, to this site. Uh, ultimately, the building will be about 160,000 square feet, including the 16,000 square foot retention of the historic gym that I'm gonna talk about in a moment. But it allows for a four-story building at the north end of the site while maintaining that no height, no portion of the building uh, will be higher than the current existing gym that's at the southern end of the site. This is important for two reasons. We think it's important for context with the rest of campus, but there's also a commitment that we made to the park mansions and to the Squirrel Hill neighborhood uh, almost 10 years ago, we brought forward this as an idea in our institutional master plan. And it's one that we are committed to uh, preserving. If we go to the next slide, please. This also just shows some of the site con conditions besides the hill. It also shows that there's uh, there are some significant trees on the site. It also shows uh, the areas where some of these trees are going to have to be removed. We'll talk about our, our tree replacement plan uh, towards the band when we get to landscape. It also shows the area that we're gonna be, the effect of the work is going to be. The larger gym, uh, which is the one with the single ridge gable shown in the upper left, will be retained and then re revitalized and reused, brought up the current code. It'll be made accessible and include air conditioning and heating. Uh, it does not currently have air conditioning in it. Uh, and the remainder of the gym, which includes Thistle Hall, which is the kind of middle structure and the North gym at the North end of the site, the smaller gym, will be demolished to make way for the new building as well as the, in the dark gray, as well as the rest of the site will be the construction area shown in the light gray. If we can go to the next slide, please. This, sh this slide shows a lot of the site conditions and the site principles. Of course, uh, being Carnegie Mellon, we are gonna be pursuing league gold under version four for the project. We were also uh, pursuing uh, fit well designation for this building uh, as well uh, under this. But there's a lot of environmental components about this. You know, there's this the, the solar exposure with a kind of long north or uh, long east west exposure as the building is north oriented north south. Also, the relationship to the park. This is one that we think is really important and one that we really want to take. This is our kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity for the university to take an opportunity to better engage with Shenley Park. As a spoiler alert, we're going to be talking about this with our master plan 
and a few months with you all, but it, it, there's a kind of pre prequel to it. One of the things we want to do is really, especially because this is a health and wellness building, the idea of embedding better connections from this facility into Shenley Park and vice versa. And so we could take advantage of this incredible asset that is on our southern flank. Uh, if we go, it was also important to note before we go to the next slide, also important, this building is doing a lot of different things. This is a building that will ultimately house our, our performance gym, which will have up to a thousand seats for basketball and volleyball events. But it also is a building where people are going to be going in and having to do one-on-one -on -one counseling, whether it be for physical health or mental health or whatever. And so, it's, and it's also a building that is kind of nestled up snug into the core of campus, but also has its exposure to the park. And so the building is really designed to maximize a lot of these things. The building that wants to be very private on one hand, it has to have an ambulance uh, loading area, for example. On the other hand, it wants to be very, very public. We need a kind of an area to be able to bring in lots and lots of people for these events. And our team has done a really great job, as you'll see here, incorporating all these kind of various pressures, these pushes and pulls on the building that really get what we think is a really exciting uh, building for campus. So if we can go to the next slide, we can start to talk about this. The way that the concept is laid out on this, the white square in the middle is the kind of key piece, which is this new thousand seat uh, 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 performance gymnasium. It's a gymnasium that'll have seats that can re retract back so we can use it for a double court for, net, for example, and um, for competitions or for uh, when you're having lots of teams playing at once. The, the mass that's to the south is the existing gym that will be maintained and rehabilitated and used as a multi-purpose uh, facility, kind of a, a field house light, if you will. The mass immediately to the left is a new multi-purpose court that'll support both the new gym as well as the old gym facility. To the north is this kind of larger, more traditional block, which will be the block that'll house the offices for the athletics department, as well as the university's health system, the CAPS program, and the wellness program. And then kind of sewing it all together is that yellow area, which is the communication area between this. This building will be a fully accessible building, unlike our current gym, which is not accessible at all. Um, uh, we are going to be making this building uh, be fully accessible throughout uh, to, for the campus uh, and the, the visitors to it. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, and the following slide, please. This is a, a kind of, if you were hovering over the corner of uh, Margaret Morrison Tech, you've got to get a good view of how the mass of this building starts to work. In the upper part of it, you see with the arched windows is the existing gym, which is the highest point on the building. Uh, immediately to the north of that, towards that, uh, the, that light, the light well, which will be a pocket garden inside the building, is the new performance gym. And then the large mass, the four-story mass that is on the north end will be the house, which will house all the various offices and health components of it, and then which will be done in masonry, in brick, to match kind of the campus aesthetic. But then along that whole western front is a combination of glass and terracotta as the, the both the multi-purpose, but really primarily about the or the communication and the circulation throughout the building. Next slide, please. Thanks, Kevin. And this is showing if you were kind of now we're back down on ground on the ground at the corner of Tech and Martin Morrison at the main entry to the building. As you can see here from this entry, and then Kent's going to talk here in a moment about the materials. You know, the building is intended to be very contextual from this side as it faces to. It's kind of more uh, reserved, especially when as approaching uh, Margaret Morrison Kennedy Hall. The main entrance is right at the corner. It's an ex fully accessible entrance. It's up a few steps. But there's also a ramp that takes you directly into the building. Um, and the more public spaces then become glass throughout. If we can go to the next slide, please. Kind of rolling around up to the south, up the hill into the south. You can also see how the building starts to integrate both into the park, but also work with a lot of the site context. Um, you'll see that long ramp that takes you up into this, the kind of more public entrance of the building, which is located at mid block. It's a fully accessible ramp that'll take you directly onto the main concourse of the building. You can also see how the building exit not only has views with glass out of the multi-purpose court, but also with doors that egress immediately out into this new plaza that's at the southwest corner of the build of the site that immediately is adjacent to Shelley Park. We'll also then also to do double duty as great kind of observation area, staging area for the annual buggy races that are part of University Carnival. So we're super excited about that as an idea as well. Uh, next slide, please. Coming back around to the southeast corner of the building, you can see where the building kind of nestles up against the western or the eastern side of the project, 
property and how we've kind of treated the loading dock. The loading dock is actually up that drive that is just kind of hidden there behind the drive uh, that goes up to the park mansions that's on their property. And this also shows where the drive where the entrance to uh, for loading as well as for ambulance services. Uh, it also shows the, the frontage along Margaret Morrison Street, which will be a much uh, as uh, there'll be the same kind of orientation as, or design as along Tech Street, very pedestrian oriented, it includes street trees that are set back. They're actually not between the sidewalk and the curb and the and the curb in this case, they're actually set back on the other side because they're integrated as part of the stormwater management uh, plan that we're going to talk about here in a few moments as well. Next slide, please. Here's a couple of internal images. This one shows that rooftop, that kind of sunken garden or the garden that's in the donut of the office block, bringing light down. Now, this is a large footprint building. And so we wanted to make sure that we could get natural light into a lot of the spaces. And so this two-story uh, interior uh, garden or pocket park will cascade down into the building to provide that natural light. Next slide, please. And this is showing the circulation the coming in where you're coming in off that main concourse that I talked about. The main concourse is this, uh, that overlooks the, the performance gym that's kind of hidden off to the left or kind of hinted at off to the left. Uh, the, the performance court seating area will be a top loaded seating area. So you'll come right off that. You come, come up the stairs from, uh, uh, from the main concourse and into the seating area. But lots of glass, lots of public views on that. Uh, next slide, please. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Kent to Kent Sherber from DCJ to talk about the elevations of materials. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot I have one more slide. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kevin. With this slide is actually sh it's showing in section, and this is a really important one. If this is showing the level of commitment that we've made of keeping the height underneath the existing building. Uh, the, the, the building on the right is the existing gym. As you can see, not only is the new gym lower than that, but all the mechanical systems are actually going to be embedded on underneath the roof of the new gym based up, up in the truss system. So you have these large triangular trusses that are gonna be holding up the roof of the performance gym. And actually the mechanical systems are gonna be tucked under there as well. So with the exception of little things like stack, like vent stacks that have to come out of the, of the roof, you will not see mechanical units on the roof of this building. And now to Kent, my apologies. And Kent, you're up. Next slide, please, to roll Kent. Sure, thanks, Bob. Can you, you hear me okay? Great, this is Kent Serbier with Bolin Swinsky Jackson. Um, so a quick uh, tour just around the building, looking at the elevations and some of the materials that we're proposing for the building. Um, as Bob began to describe with this, this building really has um, different characters uh, on the different facades that it has, right? We're starting now with the campus facade. This is on the Margaret Morrison Street side. So this is uh, a facade that really is defined by a pattern of kind of the brick panels, um, which will be a textured brick panel, um, that builds on and draws from the context of the campus, um, but uses a kind of rhythm that also draws from the proportions of the campus, but is also reflective of the di different patterns of work that are going on in the building. The ground floor is articulated differently. We have a kind of prayer room that's clad in white terracotta that you see in the center of the ground floor. And then we have a wellness suite that includes kind of some offices, a wellness lab, gallery, massage uh, rooms that all kind of occupies that kind of lighter space that will be uh, behind the rain garden that Bob was showing in that one rendering as well. Next slide, please. Thanks. The east facade is where the service dock. So you see in the center of this, the kind of service area that's tucked kind of behind the bar um, up away from Margaret Morrison Street. Uh, kind of in that wooded, next to the wooded area that's below uh, the Park Place mansions. You get the existing elevation of, of the Skibo Gym on the left-hand side of this slide, and then the performance gym in the center of the slide. Uh, there are going to be some large uh, glass openings from the performance gym uh, to into the woods that are in the kind of green space that's adjacent to this as well. Next slide, please. The south facade is actually uh, really much more of a garden space. And as, as you could kind of see in some of the images that Bob showed and he'll get into with the landscape a little bit more, here we're leaving the south facade of uh, the Skibo gym. 
And then the new Mac gym and the entrance that is there and the terraces that are there are actually pulled way back and kind of pulled away from the south edge of the site to create a green space and a series of sort of uh, rain terraces that kind of cascade down that um, side of the site. But what you are seeing here to the left is a kind of combination of the little bit of brick and the, again, the terracotta and glass. And that will bring us around to the west facade in the next slide. And this is really the open facade. This is the public face of the building. The building has two front doors. It has a campus door that speaks to the rotunda at Margaret Morrison. And it has this kind of long sloped walk that ties into Tech Street that comes up from the right in this image and really um, you know, ties up to the, the kind of connection and gateway to uh, Shenley Park. Um, this whole facade is articulated in the kind of white uh, ribbed terracotta that's an extruded terracotta rain screen. And we'll look at that kind of in the context and the materials in a minute. Um, and then the, the glass uh, kind of pa undulating panel is gonna is articulated with a, a, a series of frit kind of pattern that will uh, both control the glare and is performative, but will also kind of give this whole facade a bit of a shimmer in terms of how it's perceived as you move around it. The part at the base, kind of behind the low understory trees, because we're the street tree strategy is the same up this whole facade. There's a series of weirs and terraces that are also doing our stormwater work, but those will also be occupied with a, a, a really lovely collection of trees that kind of cascade up that. Behind that is the kind of open glass uh, kind of stair and concourse that cascades through from the two entrances. That is also gonna hinge on the kind of the elevator piece of the building for the accessibility piece, which we'll get to in the plans in just a sec as well. Next slide, please. The material palette, the context is at the base, kind of what we're drawing from. It is intended to be, uh, you know, that West facade in particular, a very contemporary thing, but it is also drawing very much from its place, from uh, looking at the ways that Henry Hornbostel was innovative with his brick, with his plasticity of facade, his pushing and pulling with his textures. Um, and so some of the originals are on the bottom. Some of what, mo much of what we're proposing is at the top, the kind of textured brick, um, using some different brick bonding patterns, using some terracotta. There will be a lot of uh, wood in the ceilings. You saw that on the inside that carries to the entrances of the building, the textured terracotta and the kind of ivory white that really is drawing directly from the kind of rotunda across the street. Next slide, please. Real quick tour through the plans. We won't spend a lot of time, but just to help understand the organization of the building. And I'll, I'm gonna zoom into each floor, I promise in a minute, because this is a bit of a eye chart. But it, the colors give you a bit of a idea of the organization of the building in terms of the athletics is all in the kind of orange and that congregates kind of around the main gym spaces. Uh, and then there's a series, these series of student spaces, these um, kind of the, the wellness, which is in the purple, kind of more front facing at the entry on the lower left then up to a kind of athletics on the second floor, the UHS in green, which is the kind of all of student health services, and then CAPS actually in the kind of most protected space up on the fourth floor with the kind of wellness garden or the pocket garden that Bob was speaking to as well. So if we can go to the next slide, please. I think one of the important things that I wanna highlight here is a, this kind of hinge point or this corner where there's a, a, a kind of concierge and library element, which is in light blue kind of here, as you come in that main door. And right adjacent to that are the main elevators for the building. Because as much as this building cascades up this topography, it also needs to unlock the existing levels of Skibo Gym, as well as all of these new four levels. And so this vertical circulation is all nested kind of in a very central location, kind of in the, the most uh, important point in the building. So that all of that kind of, you know, all the site areas are accessible and all the parts within the building are fully accessible as well. Next slide, please. This is the main uh, athletics floor where we're using the kind of, we're using some found space under the former Skibo gym in the upper right. 
to create a new suite of locker rooms that then serve kind of volleyball and basketball. Uh, you get the Mac gym kind of in the lower right here. And then the uh, main arena kind of in the center of the space. The other piece that's important to highlight here, are these light blue spaces are shared conference rooms, classrooms, and a, and a shared staff lounge, which is that kind of a prime corner position in the building. Um, and we wanna make sure that kind of we're sh creating shared spaces for the students but then there's also a concept woven into this building about caring for the caregivers. And we wanna, there's, we're trying to bring together kind of all the people who are actually working with the students in this building into some shared amenities and well, as well. And that begins to feature in some of these prime, sort of prime corner locations. While we're on this slide too, I, well, no, I'm, Bob, I was gonna highlight the interior bike parking, which is actually on Go this, ahead. Before, we, before we jump off. I know it's a little out of sequence, but there's a dark, right along this corridor, kind of next to these restrooms. Um, and I can't really point, but it's, it's kind of between the two gyms, you see a kind of a series of areas there in that corridor will be a kind of bank of about 20 indoor parking, bike parking spaces. The building will have 52 total, 20 of which will be inside at this location. Part of the logic of putting them at this location is this is also where there's some shared locker facilities on this floor. And so, the idea for that indoor parking is that that can be used also in conjunction with um, some of these general use lockers as well. Next slide, please. So at the upper level of the concourse, which is the view that Bob showed you before, we get really this kind of shared amenity space, lots of student lounge space along the windows, kind of along the west uh, facade, we get the um, UHS suite kind of nested with this intercommunicating stair and this pocket garden or uh, wellness garden as it's come to be known, which is both providing light for these uh, services to the, to the north and also providing an acoustic mm -hmm. buffer between the arena and the functions of those services. The Skibo gym is re being repurposed into a modified field house, a combination of track and turf surface for multi-sport training. Next slide. And then it's back to Bob. This is the top floor. We have the cap suite, the wellness garden in the center. Um, and then the important piece that Bob was showing in that section too is this kind of large mechanical penthouse. Uh, this was something, something that it became very important to the project to kind of not have mechanicals exposed. Uh, due to where it sits on campus and where it sits within the neighborhood. And so that's, mm -hmm. we've, we've been able to maintain that through this process. And I'll hand it back to you, Bob. Great, we go to uh, two slides up, or pass this one to the first uh, landscape si slide or site slide. Thanks, Kevin. I'm just gonna wrap it up real quick with a series of images talking about the site and about landscaping, the setbacks that we mentioned earlier. This is just a kind of a introductory site plan showing the complexities as we know there's lots of great around this site. We also have a, a lot of building that we were working to make work well on this site uh, for that. So this just kind of sets the idea of what some of the basic ideas are, uh, some of the constraints that we've been working on. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, we'll get to the idea where the trees were. As we note, there are significant trees on this site. There's about 400 uh, square, uh, 400 uh, inches of caliper uh, across this entire site that were. Uh, not all of that will be removed, as you can see a lot, or a lot of the bigger trees, especially to the south that we designed around to make sure that we could be, they could be retained as we move forward. And then we'll be working very hard with our, our construction manager, uh, Mascaro, to make sure that we are able to retain those trees. The replacement is going to be a challenge, but we've been already had sort of having discussions with the city forester about how we're going to do that. And you'll see some of the on-site work that we're going to be doing here in a moment. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, there are, as both Kevin and I mentioned, there are two itty bitty little minor setbacks that we'd like to have approved as a minor amendment to our institutional master plan. And they really are for the two entry, entry sequences to the building. Uh, as you, uh, they're outlined there, or highlighted there in orange. The, at the north, e northwest corner of the building where that two story piece kind of juts out and, perform, and forms a canopy over the main entrance of the building. We'd like to have that slight projection there to, put, to kind of make that canopy work right as an entry uh, sequence. And then the same with a, even a smaller amount 
uh, mid block, as you can see on the eastern or the western face, mid block at that secondary or the more public entrance uh, that gets you onto that second floor concourse. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, we could talk about the pedestrian circulation around the site. There's lots of things going on. We have existing sidewalks, and we're proposing to make significant improvements in regards to what the pedestrian areas are. This is an area we look, we went round and round about the idea of looking at where do we put the street trees. Um, in one, in some ways, it actually works. In this, we're proposing to put them on the inbound side of the sidewalk um, because of one, we end up wanting to one maximize where the existing sidewalks are for for people to use. But also because, as you can see at that northeast corner at Tech and Margaret Morrison, we want to create a bump out and throw down that intersection, as you can see there, uh, for that. And we, that we were worried about how that would work with the street trees to do that. If we go to the next slide, we can actually see how we then actually work with those street trees. Um, the, the red line shows the 20-foot 20, 20 curb offset for what's defined as a street tree, if you will. And you can see where we're proposing to put street trees. The intent is to create a canopy in the uh, ultimate canopy along <coughs> Tech Margaret Morrison, and as well as well as a little bit the, the extension of the Belgian block extension of Through Street that goes up the hill. But because of the way we're working here with stormwater management, we get a lot of stuff that's a lot of stormwater that's coming down from the park, down Chinley Drive, and it takes a right turn and comes right on down uh, Tech Street. And so we wanted to be able to have the stormwater management system, and it'll be done in a series of weirs and collection. You can see where the inputs are. With this, we're going to be collecting stormwater management. We're doing our stormwater management not only for the on-site stormwater, but also that's coming, as you can see in those those um, eight blue areas, doing retention or where we're going to be grabbing the water that's coming off the street as well and retaining it there. And so, in order to do that, we need to have that obviously up against the street in order to grab that stormwater. And so that's that was a this specific design decision made to do that that way. Doesn't mean that there will not be lower landscaping along the site uh, because there will be as well. Uh, for that. If we go to the last slide, I promise then we'll wrap, we'll wrap up. Uh, second to last slide, which is the construction management plan. This is a supremely tight site. And so you can see where we're looking at crane locations is how we're going to be. Uh, the parking will be removed on the east side of T uh, Tech Street during throughout the, the, the construction. However, working really side by side and really hard with uh, the, the, um, the Parkview Mansions or the, the Park Mansions folks next door to us on how we're working with them. In fact, in many cases, we have some service lines that are on their property and they have several service lines that are on our property that we're working with them to uh, reorganize and make, uh, make right as part of this whole process. So if we can just end on the last slide, one more slide to go and we can wrap up. This, the, the, this is gonna give an image again from that Southwest. It also shows, it does not have the street trees on there so we don't hide the building. Architects love to do that, but it does kind of give you an idea of what the ground cover uh, along that sidewalk will be as well, where those storm, the, that stormwater management process is going to be. So, thanks everybody. Uh, open up for questions. Okay, thank you. At this time, uh, we take no public testimony. Are there questions or comments from the commission? And I just want to let staff know that I'm having some technical difficulties and we'll be signing in on another machine. So, uh, hang tight. Um, I had a number of questions. Um, so, you know, when I went to Carnegie Mellon in 1986, there was talk of demolishing this gym way back then. So even though I am um, love the idea of being able to keep this entire building and, and do not love sort of agreeing to demolish significant buildings, um, I, I do understand that this piece doesn't really work very well. Um, and I do admire in this design how you've kept sort of the good piece of the building and then the other piece and, and solidly respected it and then have you know, worked to try and figure out how to make another building that works quite well in this space. So I think you've done a, a very good job at that, at keeping it the same height, um, all of those things. One of the sort of from the massing perspective questions I had was I don't really have a clear understanding of the facade on Margaret Morrison Street. There's a cornice on the new building that is not a dark cornice. So, you know, at CMU, there are buildings with cornices. The older building is sort of a green, very deep. Margaret Morrison has sort of 
a, a play of those two things. And so I'm curious, what's the nature of this of the cornice on this and how, because there's I don't see there are any images in your slideshow, how it relates to the old Tepper building in terms of height, you know, if you were looking up um, tech stream. Uh, maybe I'll answer the, that's that last part, uh, Becky, and then I'll let Kent uh, talk about the cornice part and the height. It's actually the 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 Posner Hall across the across Tech Street is actually a four story building as well, and it is also light at the top. Um, if right. you go to um, your slides and you look at slide, you got to go way back slide uh, six at the very beginning. If you want to do that, follow along at home to do that. Slide six shows where the Posner Building is actually a, a three story building. Starts as a two story building, comes out of the ground at the at the north end as a three story building uh, as brick, and then there's a fourth floor that is metal that is a lighter kind of anodized aluminum that is on the top uh, floor of that building that wraps that entire fourth floor uh, of the building. I think that was part of the genesis of that. It's also matching where that height is. I also just want to take your first statement about the historic component of the building. We've wrestled with this for a long time as well, Becky. You know, we looked at this as, the, the, you know, I'm not one to want to just kind of go run down, and, especially a Hornbossel building. That's, those are pretty important. Um, and I think you hit it on exactly right. You know, the North Gym, the South Gym is really an impressive piece. And, it, it, you know, the, the the structure on the inside of the building that's, that holds it up is really phenomenal. And that is the best of a building that the remainder of the building is has its high points, but it is really not a functional building. It is not, there's not, a, 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 there's 17 different roofs on the remainder of the building. So there's no levels that match up. There's no elevator. There's no air conditioning. It's hard to be. Uh, a collegiate level athletics, have a collegiate level athletics group without air conditioning in your weight rooms. Um, and so if we had to look at this and kind of bite the bullet and say, let's keep the best part. So I appreciate your, your, uh, your statement on that. We've been wrestling about this for quite some time as well. Kent, if you could ask, talk about the cornice. Sure. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll pile on it. I think it is with a heavy heart that we go to demolish any Hornbossel piece. And I think we, we actually were tempted at the beginning of this to say, we can unsolve, we can solve it, we can unwind it. And we, we could not. <laughs> um, but uh, the cornice, so the existing gym has actually, it's a wood, a dark wood cornice, and then it has the copper. And the other piece that I forgot to mention is the one, th a couple of things that we are able to do with the demolition is we're going to salvage all the copper off that existing building. And that's actually going to occupy a lot of the, the in the kind of um, entry part of the building in the wellness suite. Um, it's likely going to move inside the building. In terms of the cornice that we're looking at, we still have, we do need to make sure we get the proper detail in that, I think, so that it doesn't pale. We don't want to, I don't want to copy Margaret Morrison. It is intentionally light though. It's not intention, intended to be green uh, because I don't think we want it to match Posner. Um, it's more intended to be in that kind of light uh, tone that you actually see at the top of Margaret Morrison and you see at CFA. Um, this one is unlike at ANSYS where we looked much more, we we're over by Baker and Porter and we looked at Baker and Porter which have much darker soffits and fascias. Here we were looking much more to the College of Fine Arts and uh, Margaret Morrison I think for that. I think the key to that will be making sure it's not just a flat metal panel um, and making sure it has enough uh, finesse in that detail that it um, can hold up in that context. I don't know if that answers your question, but it is intended to be light. <laughs> so. No, and I, I can appreciate that. I guess it might be helpful, and I don't know if you have this drawing already for the next time you come to show sort of how that facade on Margaret Morrison relates more to the, I'm just gonna keep calling it the old Tepper building. The old, <laughs> <laughs> the Posner Hall, I guess. Posner, Posner yeah. Hall. Um, yeah, because these are from above, there's an aerial from above, there's a little piece that's much more diagrammatic. Yeah. And I just would like to sort of see it in that context. I think the other um, detail sort of shows more how it relates to Margaret Morrison. I can, yeah. I can understand that. Um, that elevation is a little tricky for me. No, we can show it, kind of the relationship between those parts for sure. Okay, that would be super helpful. Um, and then the other things that get lost in this, the loss of the building, <laughs> the loss of the old piece of the building, the loss of the big trees. Um, and then there is something that happens in the outdoor space now 
that is sort of super functional college student and teacher um, outdoor space. You know, there's benches for picnics. People are constantly having their lunch there. You know, you'll walk all the way across campus to have your lunch there. There's seating that happens, people sitting on the steps waiting for their friends and that sort of thing. I think the facade, the way that the um, seating works on Margaret Morrison is is working for you, but I'm a little, I'm a little bit, I guess I have some questions about how it works on the tech street, the Frew Street side, and, and whether or not there are ways to sort of make that outdoor space. I understand the idea of the cascade and watching perhaps the steps watching buggy races. I'm just wondering if there could be more ways for people to not have to feel like they're curled up in a tiny ball waiting for their friends at that corner. Um, and then I, and that sort of ties into my overall sort of feeling about how that whole side relates to Shenley Park. Um, and if you're late for class or you're a teacher who's late for class and you're riding your bike or walking or coming down Shenley Drive and you swoop into and down um, Frew Street, Frew Street, I get them confused. Yes. Tech Street, Tech Street. <laughs> I think I, I'm sort of concerned that this building hasn't sort of, or not, maybe it's not the building necessarily, but even the way that the, the, the parking and the curbs work, that in fact now, because you've put this jut out at Margaret Morrison at the base, it adds to that overall effect of like, come around, I know there's a stop sign, and then speed down the street. Um, because there's a, a, a crosswalk there, but there's not a sidewalk on the opposite side and the Shenley Park side. Um, maybe this is, maybe Bob, this is more like a comment about your master plan in the future. How do you deal it's, with and, and, and all Becky, of you're, those intersections? You've been, you've been reading our minds. This is, we actually met out on the site last week with uh, Domi and with Parks Conservancy to start talking about how we can better integrate uh, on the park side. The, park, uh, the Parks Conservancy has uh, capital projects coming in the not too in the next year or so to start to fix some of that corner, and we want to. We're talking about them how we can help kind of propel that. As, and as part of again, a spoiler alert, as part of our master plan, one of the things that we are going to be advocating for is uh, traffic control, better traffic control, where Shenley Drive kind of makes its curl and Tech Street ties into that. Even looking at the possibility of adding a three-way stop there to help slow down the traffic in that area, so that we can get to making that a much more safe pedestrian and bike zone. Yeah. And I think it's come a long way, but I think it has further to go. So that's it. That's it. Thank you for answering that. So and then we'll bring, we'll bring some additional images for the, uh, the, at the, for the action that with additional kind of deeper look at the, the especially that South end landscaping that where it, it, it interacts with the park. Thank you. That would be super helpful. Um, yep. And then, so is there, are there still, is there going to be still parking on um, Tech Street? Uh, on Tech Street, on yes, there will be. And Frew Street, okay. Yep. So, so that will help. Yep. All right. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Other questions and comments, commissioners? Um, I was wondering if there's any, um, Anything that the building does to take advantage of or to assist in the seasonal activities relating to buggy? And if there are any things because it has any sort of emergency egress required for ambulances or things that affect that type of road closure activity, what does this do to the buggy um, activities? Actually, if you could, uh, whoever's driving, if you could go to slide uh, 13. I think that gives a, a, a good way to show that. We've actually specifically, Christine, have moved the ambulance location so that the ambulances would come and go off of Margaret Morrison Street. So they could come in from Forbes, take right on Margaret Morrison, come in, do their business on the ca campus, and then egress back out to, uh, I'm sorry, slide nine. I was looking at the date. <laughs> slide nine. Um, sorry, Kevin. Um, uh, that they can egress back out again without having to utilize Tech Street to do that. There we go. So you can see where that A is in that kind of eastern side where the L and the A is the loading dock and the ambulance bay. 
so that they can kind of come in and out of there and take a right on goal eastbound on Margaret Morrison to get the forms and avoid tech altogether. The other part of it is um, there's, there's that whole facade or that whole landscape work along that uh, that western facade of the building along the along the east side of, of, of Tech Street has really been carefully kind of uh, thought of. And if you maybe slide 14 is a good example of that, showing how we're creating uh, pathways for both movement through it on a daily basis, but at the same time, also creating areas that could be used for the functions like buggy. You can see the ramp that's kind of has that incline goes up onto that second floor main concourse. It also gets you elevated then so you can be above the street looking onto the buggy as they go through the push up the hill. The stairs that are shown on the right here going up to that entry into that to that outdoor plaza that's kind of nestled up against the existing gym. Those stairs will give a great view, especially of where the both the main first push up the hill, but then where a buggy completes itself at the corner. And back just one last note, I think uh, to Becky's point, I think that we'll bring images that show this better, but also you know the idea of creating a lot of seat walls and things like along the edge so that you can start to get some additional outdoor seating. But like I said, we'll dig in. It's hard to see. There's a guy sitting way up in that kind of up against the back building next to the left of that big tree. There's actually seating up there. We we need to. We'll have better images that show that more. For next time because there has been thought paid to having outdoor seating areas outdoor classroom areas especially up in that upper uh, upper uh, bench area <coughs> excuse me thank you mm -hmm. other questions or comments from the commission okay hearing none we'll see you in uh, two weeks thanks great thank appreciate it thank you Okay, it takes us to item C, which is DCBR 2019 00563, address 3112 Smallman Street, new construction for a multi unit residential building in the Strip District neighborhood. Again, Mr. Kunak. Good afternoon again, Commissioners. Um, this is a project development plan for demolition and new construction of an eight story multi unit residential structure with 243 dwelling units, approximately 14,000 gross square feet of retail, and integral parking for 259 automobile spaces. The application is located in the RIV IMU zoning district. This application appeared before the ZBA as case 160 of 2019. A settlement agreement decided that the applicant shall be granted a dimensional height variance of 100 feet and a dimensional variance to allow for 0% of the building frontage along 32nd Street to be located in the build to zone. Um, all additional height shall be allowed pursuant to the bonus provisions of code section 905.04.K1. Uh, the settlement agreement is attached to the briefing report for your reference. Uh, the application is requesting four uh, performance points for the 40 feet to get up to 100 feet. Uh, the stormwater management plan has not yet been um, submitted for review. A transportation impact study has been submitted and is under review by the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure. Uh, the proposed project was reviewed by the Contextual Design Advisory Panel on June 11th, 2019, and by staff design review on May 17th, 2021. The um, CDAP um, summary report is attached to your briefing report as well. And a development activities meeting is not required as there is no registered um, community organization in this location. Um, at this time, I will turn it over to the applicants for a sound check. Uh, are we ready to start? We are. Okay. We can Hi. hear you. Hi, everyone. Um, Cy Lample, um, counsel for uh, West Rise Capital, the uh, applicant today, um, also presenting. And I will just be doing a brief overview. And I'm here for any questions. Our main presenters will be our architect who's following me, Carl uh, Smeltzer from Gensler. Um, Drew Harbaugh from Clavon Design will be talking about the, the landscape aspects of things. And Bob Getz from Trans Associates will be going over the uh, traffic aspects. If you could move to the second page, please. Um, this is just the overview of our presentation. Uh, Carl will be covering everything up to where it says landscaping at that last part. 
Uh, Drew will be covering everything thereafter except the last slide, which Bob will go over. Uh, Kevin gave a, a pretty good and succinct summary of everything, just to, just to reiterate. Um, this is located between 31st and 32nd Street and Smallman Street and Mulberry Way in the uh, Strip District, the RIV IMU zoning district. Um, this is for a uh, mixed use 243 unit um, residential with a first floor retail space uh, building um, with eight stories and 259 parking spaces. Um, we have been in communications with the local community groups, strip district neighbors throughout the entire process. And we have received a letter of report, which we've attached to this and submitted, which is uh, that letter is dated, I believe, March 22nd, 2021. Um, that, that, that's kind of all I really have to say. Obviously, I'm here for any other questions, but I'll pass it over to Carl to get into the details of the presentation. Hello, this is Carl Smeltzer. Can you hear me all? I think that was a nodded yes, correct? We okay. can, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so in, in order to keep this brief, I think we can probably jump ahead to the um, three slides from here. But our, in the general design of the project is to really meld the roots of the strip district and the warehouses and the, the aesthetic that comes with that with a, with a modern reinterpretation of that into this residential project that, that has its ties and its roots back to the beauty of the warehouse buildings in the area and the history of the strip district and create a modern interpretation upon that. If you can go to the next slide, slide please. So really, you know, we took a close look at some of the, the, the historic and the, the warehouse buildings that are there and wanted to really draw upon what influenced those buildings into our current design. N next slide. And really taking a look at creating a, a a nice punched masonry building that has roots with the, the steel and a modern material palette. Next slide. So we're looking at using masonry, the reuse of a, a potential reuse of a gantry crane and mixing that with more modern materials like um, aluminum panels and glass and point supported glass and steel as well in the in the new building design. Next slide. And you can go to the next slide as well. So the project is located in the northeastern um, portion of the strip district in the and you can see it in red in the far right next to the th right where the 31st street bridge lands next slide. And it's bounded by 31st Street to the south, Smallman Street to the north, um, 32nd Street on the east, and um, Mulberry Way, Way, the alley on the, the south side of it. Next slide. And this shows the context. This is an aerial photo that shows the, the full block that is where our project will go. And you can see the 31st Street Bridge as it comes down and lands and crosses over Smallman Street to the on the left side of the, the site. Next slide. This shows the existing context photos at street level um, down at the 31st Street side of the site. And then the next slide. Then this is at the 32nd Street side of the site. On the 30, bordering along the 32nd Street side of the site, we are going to create a small plaza um, and setback of the building on, on the 32nd Street side. Next slide. And then this is context photos of the alleyway, Mulberry Way at the back of the building. Next slide.
This is a zoning diagram that shows the setbacks of the building. So the building, as mentioned earlier, will be within one, the 100 foot height limit that was previously established. And then it has, shows a 10 foot setback at the bottom of the, at the lowest floor of the site for where the garage sets back to the main face that's along Smallman Street. And then it, at, before we get to 85 feet, we have an additional 10 foot setback for the top two floors of the building. Next slide. And as mentioned earlier, we've, we've met with the local community and, and the construction management plan is shown on the left and the a letter of support from the stri strip district neighbors is shown on the right. Next slide. So we'll get into the, the design drawings and the perspectives and renderings for the project now. Next slide. So this shows the overall elevation and rendering of the building from 32nd Street, looking down um, Smallman Street, kind of back towards the city would be in the distance. And it shows the small kind of plaza area where we're set back from 32nd Street on the left. The, entrance, the main entrance to the residential portion of the building will be mid-block on Smallman Street. And then there'll be a, um, a flexible either space for tech or retail that's on the ground floor of the building in the, in this, in the main corner here at 32nd Street to help activate the, the streetscape. Next slide. So this is, I'll jump through the floor plans pretty quick here, but this is the, the below grade parking level. The parking and access and loading access are both off of the alleyway, Mulberry Way towards the south. Next slide. And here's the ground floor plan. So we have the, the entry to the, the residential building is in mid block. The first floor to the left, has um, parking spaces in it that also has a mezzanine above that. Um, both of those spaces are being designed to be later converted to usable space if, if and when the parking requirements reduce potentially in the future. And then on the, the right side of the, the floor plan, we have the large tech flex retail space for other uses. And then there's a small plaza area along 32nd Street on the far right of the plan. Next slide. This is the mezzanine area with the um, additional parking for this floor. And then the, the double height space for the lobby and the retail spaces would be to the right. And then the loading dock is directly behind the lobby, um, located off of the mall, off of the alleyway and Mulberry Way. Next slide. This is the for the the typical floor plans of the units. The mix is still um, being determined, but as we go up through the building, there will basically be uh, two floors of units that are stacked together with an amenity space in the middle that can be shared amongst the units themselves. And then we're looking to provide ample outdoor terrace balcony space to as many units as we can. So in this case, on the second floor, there's where the garage steps back, where the building steps back from the garage, the 10 feet, we have um, terrace space along the north and the west part of this plan for all those units. Next slide. And then as we move up through the building, there's the, you know, a slightly different stack of plans, but every two floors there would be a set of amenity space with the units. Next slide. And this shows the top two floors of the building, which are where we have the 10 foot setback that allows terrace space around all three sides of the building for the, the residential units and you know, slightly different layouts as well, where we might have some loft units that are two floors on the, on, connected on the top two floors. Next slide. And then this is the rooftop plan. It shows the, uh, there'll be a, a large amenity space on the 
on the west side of the building that and and north looking out towards the river and towards downtown and then the rest of the 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 penthouse level would be for mechanical use. We are also looking at possibly putting um, PV units and uh, arrays on top of the, the mechanical, the flat roofs of the mechanical, enclosed mechanical rooms. Next slide. So here's an aerial rendering. Um, looking at, again, this is from sort of the 32nd Street vantage point, looking back towards the building, the, the hill would be behind the, behind the building in this case. And so this shows sort of the, the, the brick full box with the, the more modern uh, metal panel box of the two stories above it and in terms of the massing presentation of the building. Next slide. This is a detail at the main entry of the mid block of the building. Next slide. And then this is the uh, long cross section through the building showing the stacking of the below gray garage that's mostly set into the ground. And then the, the two on the left side of the build, building, there's the two stories of parking that are part of the tall ground floor with the flex retail space on the right. And then the stack of the, the residential unit floors above that. Next slide. And then this shows the, the elevation from Smallman Street. Next slide. And the two side elevations. Next slide. And then we have a set of sun and shadow studies um, representing the spring and fall equinox and of course the winter and summer equinox. You can just sort of flip through these slides. And then I'll turn it over to Drew from Clavon to talk about the landscape. This, this slide here is the last line land title survey slide before going into the landscape presentation. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Drew Harbaugh, I work with Clavon Design Associates. Uh, let's go one next slide forward, talk about the landscape. Uh, we have a basic plant material Pallet board. Uh, as of right now, um, I'm in the process of scheduling a meeting with the city forester, which that should take place later this week uh, or early next week to nail down specific shade trees, street trees, things like that. Right now, um, we're showing basically a honey locust. Next slide, slide please. Oh, materials board, just basic. Uh, what type of, of paving, uh, more than likely it will be, end up being uh, some type of concrete. I'll get more into that in the uh, stormwater section. Next slide after that. So this is landscape requirements plan. Uh, as a whole, 31st and Smallman Street are fairly simplistic uh, landscape. It's just basically a, a three foot wide street tree pit um, with a larger scaled uh, street tree and ornamental grasses underneath to try to break up the and separate the pedestrian space to the vehicular space. Um, for the uh, riverfront zoning, we were required the 10 foot sidewalk with a five foot clear zone, which, which essentially limited our, what we could do on 31st at Smallman. 32nd Street, as Carl had talked about earlier, there is a little more room for a plaza. Uh, essentially, it would be basically raised planters, um, different type of, of probably looking more at river birch, something a little smaller, more intimate. Um, next slide after that. This is our typical site plan. Again, we, we proposed 
uh, honey locust and betula, and then also uh, the ornamental grasses. Uh, we have a conversation. By the time we have the next uh, hearing, we should have a uh, plant palette solidified. Next slide. Uh, these are just typical city details. Next slide. Stormwater management. Okay, as we showed a few slides back, we're uh, going for a number of performance points. Um, in particular, for this one, we're looking at going for performance points 5A and potentially B. Uh, as of right now, we're reducing the total area of disturbance uh, by adding the landscape. As of right now, it's basically an entire impervious site. Uh, so for the performance point system, we would need to capture 15% of an inch and a half in a 24 hour period. The way our stormwater system is devised, uh, we will have two tanks on either side of the building, which is image one. And then image two, our actual storage will be uh, soil cells. And this will be reused, uh, it'll go from the storage tank to either be reused as irrigation for on-site or for gray water use within the building, more than likely uh, connected to hose bibs for the parking area and things like that. Our total volume of our system is uh, 5,400 cubic feet, which we are within three or 400 cubic feet of actually being able to meet the 75% portion, which is, which is why we may or may not go for that point. Basically the system will capture all of the roof leaders coming off of the, off of the uh, roof of the building. It'll also capture 31st street and 32nd street. Along Smallman, we're still kind of trying to figure out how we're gonna capture that. It could be potentially if we can't grade it to fall to the east and west of the, uh, of the building, then we may end up directing it into the plant beds and having a, uh, a conveyance system underneath the plant beds connect into the stormwater system. Um, next slide. And Bob Getz from Trans will talk about the loading area. Uh, thanks, Drew. Um, so the uh, access to the parking garage and then also the um, two loading dock spaces is from Mulberry Way. Uh, we will be uh, requesting or have requested an administrator's exception for the loading. Uh, per code, we would need five uh, loading dock spaces for uh, the uses in this building. We're um, proposing two. We found that uh, it's largely a residential use. Uh, we've uh, performed a study and showed that uh, the two uh, loading dock spaces uh, should be sufficient. Uh, one other um, minor modification we're requesting is the aisle width in the, um, the parking aisle width in the garage from a reduction from 24 feet to uh, 22 feet. And uh, again, um, we've showed uh, turning templates in the garage that uh, you can still uh, safely maneuver in and out of uh, the spaces. Um, other than that, I think the only thing that we haven't touched on is the bicycle parking. And uh, there's a total requirement for 83 bicycle parking spaces for the, um, for the use, and we're providing those. Uh, majority of those will be in the bike room. We'll also have some uh, public use spaces out along uh, Smallman Street uh, in uh, bike racks. Um, Domi has reviewed the uh, traffic memo, as was uh, mentioned earlier, and um, for the most part, I think we're, we're um, in agreement or in line. Uh, a few minor things. Uh, one would be uh, the large opening shown there along uh, Mulberry Way for the loading and the uh, access to the garage. Uh, Domi would like to see that uh, broken up a little bit, so there would be a pedestrian refuge uh, somewhere in that opening. It's uh, a little over 100 feet wide, and uh, we would propose uh, breaking that up between the uh, garage ramps and loading spaces such that 
uh, more or less we're proposing two 50 foot uh, wide um, curb aprons there. So uh, pedestrians, uh, if need be, could uh, could have refuge uh, in between there. And you can see that parking lot or the sidewalk along Mulberry Way is uh, is being proposed the length of the building. Um, I believe this is the last slide, so that uh, concludes uh, our presentation. Okay, thank you. At this time, we take no public testimony, but we do have questions and comments from the commission. Commissioner Dick. Uh, we have received some correspondence from neighbors who have concerns about the heavy use of Mulberry Way for uh, access and, and uh, refuge and refuse removal and so on. Uh, how, how do you rationalize uh, using this uh, for all these uses simultaneously? Uh, well, in terms of uh, loading, um, Again, our studies show that uh, on average, uh, move-ins and move-outs are, are um, approximately one per week on a building this size, uh, 240, uh, approximately 240 units. Um, during those times, typically the uh, management of the building schedules those so, such that, um, you know, obviously we don't have two, two move-ins move -ins and move-outs occurring at the same time. Uh, the other services, the refuse service uh, is a fairly brief stop other deliveries would include um, just uh, the small amount of retail in the building and then any deliveries to, to the retail. Uh, so we're still showing a majority of the time that the loading box uh, would, would be empty or, or actually not in use. Um, other than that, we have obviously just um, residents uh, coming and going uh, through, the, uh, through Mulberry to access the building. And uh, you know, towards that, uh, the previous proposed proposed use for the site was actually much more uh, traffic intensive. This proposed use is uh, approximately one half the uh, traffic volume that we had back when uh, it was predominantly an office building. So um, we're, we'd we like to really keep all the loading and, and the access on Mulberry um, for obvious reasons. And, um, you know, so I guess compared to the previous proposal, this is actually, uh, uh, I believe, a far better um, plan. Thank you. Thank you. I have a follow-up question regarding Mulberry. So the rear of the building looks like a zero setback, but you're showing sidewalks. Are you installing sidewalks and how wide are those? Uh, that might be a better question for um, Carl. Yeah, let me, the going it on page 21 we have a sidewalk that's five foot ten inches right and now. so what i guess what is the current width of mulberry way and how uh, much is left after you install the sidewalk because you're also showing a sidewalk across mulberry way that i don't that doesn't exist in the arrows so how wide will the remaining Mulberry Way be? I believe we're um, proposing 16 feet. Uh, existing Mulberry, which really has no sidewalks to speak of, uh, just pretty much comes right up to the uh, Jemka building in the back there. Uh, it's about 19 feet wide. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Um, so right now there is a tremendous amount of bike traffic on Mulberry Way. Um, I think maybe at this point they do many bikes sneak over to Smallman. Um, so my question is maybe uh, some city planning staff knows the answer to this, but where are the planned bike lanes in this area of the Strip District or the Caro's? Does anybody know the answer to this question? How, what's happening around this building in terms of the bike directions? Um, this is Katie from Domi. Um, 
or Katie Reed from Domi. Oh, I guess we're not on the record now, so whatever. Okay, anyway, sorry. Um, so I cannot speak to the exact operations, but my understanding um, is that the uh, bike, bike lane along here will um, be on Smallman, I think. I think that's right. I will find out by the next, um, by the uh, next hearing for sure. Okay, great. That I don't want to give you the wrong information. Thank also, you. just for everyone's edification on if you look at any of the aerials i think one of the the 31st street end of the property runs into a dead end with the 31st street bridge so to the extent that there's i guess biking on mulberry lane one end of the property was a literal dead stop for any there wouldn't be a path obviously through the bridge so just just as a um we asked this of projects especially in the strip because the pedestrian bike and and uh, public transit infrastructure is not very well articulated it would be very helpful for you to have a plan that shows the pathways to the nearest bus stops especially all the way over to um, Heron Avenue which is the busway station um, as well as the bikes and the riverfront itself too so you can bring that next time okay um, and then, so my question is about the bike, the bike room that's in the garage. Do people have to go through the garage on their bicycles to get into the bike room? There's not a door, it doesn't look like to the outside. And that's, especially if you're thinking about people with small children and small bicycles, this is not optimal um, for, for, getting, for getting out. Yeah, cur currently the bike room is accessed through the garage. That is something we could look at. The, gr the first floor of the garage is a few feet above the grade there. So, you know, you that's really kind of the, the, the trickiest part. Even though it's located on the outside of the building, it would be, you know, three to four feet above the grade there at that point. So um, that is something we could look at, though. Was that for a floodplain? I missed if you had a conversation about floodplain. Um, we've, we've tried to pull the, the lowest level of the garage up as much as we can just due to bad soil conditions and floodplain issues so that we don't have to excavate as, you know, as much dirt as possible to get that lowest level of parking in. So the bike room is on the second level of parking. It's, it's on the first floor. It's just, it's, uh, it's elevated a few feet above it's a, it's adjacent grade, if that makes sense, because that first floor is sits like three, four feet above kind of the, the ground plane of the building. Okay. Um, um, Katie, did you want to say something? <laughs> Sorry, I was just going to jump in about the bike lane thing. Um, I confirmed there, there is a, um, a bike route on Smallman and on Penn. And 32nd right there is uh, being being treated as sort of a, a, a cross um, crossways. Uh, That's where Penn Avenue changes from one direction to two directions. Yes. And so many bikes who are going down Smallman Street then turn on 32nd and then turn on to Penn. Yep, on 32nd and then on to Penn because it's a, uh, Penn is a more welcoming there to site costs. Yeah, okay, thank you, that's that's helpful. I'll, 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 I'll do this. I, I wonder, can somebody explain the variance that was received for the 0% along 32nd Street to be located in the bill too? What does that actually mean? What's, what's the net effect of that? Uh, essentially, that means that we can set the building back off of the property line. You can step it back. It's yes. Okay, got it. Okay, and and you couldn't prior to that variance. Correct, and that yes. Okay, thank you. There's a percentage requirement, so a percentage of the building would have to be at the built to line. Um, oh, I see. So so that people don't build, so we don't get things that are built way back. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Um. I think there are a couple of positive things um, here. I think that the, um, I appreciate the tech flex space and the possibility of allowing for not just a kind of exercise room on the ground floor or retail, but some sort of other function 
um, down there, especially because there are so many tech flex spaces in the district that it's important to, um, to integrate those things and to really have a mixed use opportunity. And I also appreciate if I heard correctly that the bottom two floors of the garage might be able to be converted. Did I hear that correctly? That's correct. I think that's I think that's good. Um, whether or not we ever get to execute that is another thing, but that's fantastic to be thinking ahead like that. I appreciate that. And I also appreciate the simplicity of the facade and the kind of evocation of something that is kind of a mute building type. And I, the warehouse building is, um, uh, you know, certainly seems to be making a nod towards the context. Um, the comment I have about this project isn't really about the applicant's project. It's uh, a, a comment to the commission about the need for neighborhood planning in the strip district in particular. Um, this is one of many projects that we see where we have multiple small parcels being consolidated and built upon in a big project type. And while this particular project on its own might not tip that neighborhood into becoming something unrecognizable, as we get more and more of these projects that are maximizing their pro forma and their density, the kind of character and granularity of the strip district that we know and love, the ability to have multiple building types, to have activity out on the street and truly mixed use begins to get um, scrubbed from the, the neighborhood. And I don't think that right now that as a planning commission, we have the tools to talk about what it means to have 140 feet deep lots by a couple hundred feet. This is a very long building, which isn't out of character with some of the large warehouses that are there, but we certainly wouldn't want to see every lot kind of turned into these really large maximized uh, uh, FARs that, um, you know, really change the way we think of the strip district today. And in fact, the reason why people like to build there. Um, so I guess I would um, really uh, ask, and I know that staff is already thinking about it, is how do we as a planning commission, as a city, have the tools to think about the strip district and account for open space and account for walkable streets and account for um, a kind of granularity that isn't block by block um, so that when we look at this, neighborhood 20 years from now, we don't say, boy, this used to be the strip, but I'm not sure what it is now. So uh, not a comment about this application, but just a comment about future applications and how we might think about that. I have a follow-up uh, kind of similar specific to this application and how this property does fit into the overall scheme of the strip district. Forgive me if I miss this, but I do not see an elevation drawing or photo along Mulberry. Can you direct me to that? Especially because of the height of the building, Mulberry, is, that Mulberry side is going to be seen from Penn. We, we don't have a elevation in the package, but it's intended to be very similar to the other three elevations. Okay, so when you come back, I'd like to see that elevation and I'd like to see what it looks like from Penn. We can provide that. Thank you. And kind of along the same lines, you have these really good aerials and kind of context photographs of the existing structure. There aren't, I don't know, I see the shadow studies, but we'd like to see a little bit more about how the future structure will fit in with the surrounding properties. Okay. All done. Audio now unmuted. Uh, Commissioner Dick, did you want to say something? Uh, just a quick question. And I realize we don't have a person from the Port Authority there, but could people from Trans Associates and Domi ascertain whether or not the uh, Port Authority has any plans at all for providing any uh, at least minimal bus service along Smallman, given all the development that's going on in this area? I think that's pertinent to considering this, this application. So when you come back with your, uh, bring us a mobility plan drawing, you know, showing where all these things are and just fold that, uh, that question into, or that answer into that drawing, that'd be great.
other questions or comments from the commission? Um, I saw that you had a meeting with neighbors in the strip. Were there any other nearby neighbors or other community people that you met with about this project and what was their feedback? There were no others. That was the only group that we met with. Uh, Commissioner Mingo, did you want to follow up with anything? Uh, you didn't meet with adjoining property owners or any of the property I believe owners? The, I, be, I was not at the meeting, but I believe the adjoining property owners were at that meeting with the community group. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much for a thorough presentation, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, commissioners, that takes us to item D, which is DCP ZDR 2021-06286, address 3401 Bates Street, demolition of multiple properties in the Oakland public realm, central Oakland neighborhood. Again, Mr. Kuna. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, this is an application for demolition of 12 single family attached townhomes in the Oakland Public Realm D zoning district. Uh, the addresses include um, from 3401 to 3421 Bates Street and 392 Colt Coltart Avenue. A development activities meeting was held virtually on June 21st, uh, June 24th. 2021 with the Oakland Planning and Development Corporation, the registered community organization for this location. Um, a summary report from that DAM meeting is attached to your briefing report. At this time, I will turn it over to the applicants for the sound check. And also a reminder that um, flipping between slides is a little slower this afternoon. So please be patient. Great, thank you, Kevin. Uh, can everyone hear me? We can, thank you. Excellent. Uh, just before I begin, if, if I could also have uh, John Kamen uh, included uh, as a presenter for this, uh, he'll be available to the extent there's any questions, but if he could be added, I'd appreciate that. So with that, uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, members of the commission. My name is Ryan Wotis. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Goldberg, Kamen and Garvin here on behalf of the applicant. Uh, with respect to uh, the proposed uh, demolition plan of 12 uh, row homes that are located in the Oakland uh, neighborhood of the city of Pittsburgh. What we have uh, showing on this first page to go ahead and orient the commission to uh, the location of the subject properties. Uh, this is an aerial view where the property is outlined in red uh, right in the center of that photograph. Uh, the uh, street to the immediate right on that photo, that is Bates Street. Uh, coming from the bottom of that picture and moving upward, that is uh, moving in a direction from Second Avenue uh, in the Parkway East, uh, heading toward uh, basically what I would consider the, the central business area of uh, the Oakland neighborhood. The street directly to the south, uh, that is the Boulevard of the Allies, and the street directly to the north of that is Zulima Street. Um, and again, subject properties are located in the middle, consisting of 12 townhomes. Uh, the addresses are actually 3401 through 3421 Bates Street, uh, and one that's located at th uh, 392 uh, Coltart Avenue. Um, this is also in front of the commission because this property is located in the Oakland public realm, uh, subdistrict D. Uh, so any demolition plan uh, needs to come before the commission for uh, review and approval. If you could please uh, go to the second slide. I'd appreciate it. So I wanted to give the commission uh, a, a basically an overview of uh, the existing conditions of this site. Um, as shown in these photographs, you'll see that the property uh, is, is basically dilapidated um, and is in significant disrepair. They, these properties have been condemned uh, by the city. They had some existing tax liens and other violations associated with them, all of which uh, uh, predate my client's ownership of this property and all of which will be remedied uh, as part of their ownership and moving through the process of demolition of these structures. Uh, this view is from the corner of Bates Street and the Boulevard of the Allies. 
uh, what you're looking generally in a direction, a northwesterly direction, where to orient you, McGee Women's Hospital would basically be if you went directly through on this photograph to the rear of the site. Um, so this is the, the first of the row homes as you're moving in a northerly, northerly direction along Bates. If you could go to the next slide, please. Again, to give uh, additional context, this is uh, a few townhomes, uh, row houses up to the north. Again, giving an idea of uh, what the existing condition is. This is again facing a westerly direction uh, from Bates Street. Uh, next slide, please. This would be a view then from the corner of Bates and Zulima, uh, looking basically west, uh, again, coming just to orient the board. Uh, to the left of the, the photograph would be, again, traffic coming from uh, the Second Avenue uh, corridor up the hill up, up Bates Street. Next slide, please. This is the demolition plan uh, that was submitted to the city of Pittsburgh. There was also a narrative that was submitted as part of uh, this application and submission outlining uh, how demolition would take place, the safety protocols that will be put in, in place uh, while the demolition was occurring, and then basically post-site um, uh, stabilization. So as shown here, uh, is existing conditions showing those 12 units. Um, identifies them as two-story brick and frame buildings. Uh, as part of this proposal, all of those uh, improvements would be, uh, would be raised and removed from the site. Uh, next slide, please. And again, this was also submitted as part of our application. This is a site stabilization plan. Uh, after the buildings are raised, uh, the property would be backfilled to the, the extent needed, graded, and then seeded. Uh, and basically at, at this point, what's being proposed is to just maintain that uh, as grass uh, in that location. Um, that's, that's the extent of uh, our presentation, not as, not as long or as complex as the, the first three, but uh, that's the general overview of what's being proposed for this site. And so we're happy to uh, address any comments or questions that the board uh, may have. Okay, great, thank you very much. Uh, at this time, there's no public testimony. Uh, the questions or comments from the commission. Are the two billboards being removed um, at the time that the houses are being demolished? The answer is yes, Commissioner Mingo. Other questions or comments? Commissioner Dietrich. Yeah, do you have um, more on the, the outcome of the community plan? Or I know you've, there's been quite a number of meetings in various years over this this parcel but um i don't know ryan if you have like a summary slide of some of that we we do not have a summary slide of basically the history um as indicated we did have a, a recent meeting with um the, the open community group um but we could go ahead and and to the extent possible some of that uh, predates obviously our clients ownership but we could we could look into the history of that and, and see if we can put something together uh when we come back before the commission in two weeks Thanks. Commissioner, I do know that this has been a top priority for Oakland uh, in the past several years to get these properties demolished. Um, they, they have been in, in terrible condition. In fact, when we were doing our inspection, some of them don't even have floors in them. Um, you open up the door and you fall right into the basement. So uh, I know that this has been a, a ma major focus of getting these properties demolished. Yeah, there's been previous things, hotels, all kinds of things for that site. So yeah, and, and to to, res to respond to that, Commissioner, um, the, you know, as a part of the work that the city and the yeah. community organizations are doing around the Oakland plan, uh, there were a series of charrettes specifically around um, a site centered on the Boulevard of the Allies and Zalima Street, which did include these properties. Uh, that is available on the city's website through the engage P the engage PGH platform. So. Um, you know, so you and other commissioners are, you know, all of the information from the charrettes as to uh, the potential for future use of the site, um, although, you know, obviously um, not identified by the applicant at this time, um, you know, the, but the discussion through the plan is available there. And I would assume that, I mean, oftentimes when a demolition comes without a plan, we have concern that something will never be built there. Um, I assume that this is that there is intention to build here. Um, this 
it, this is they're going to sell it to Pitt. So, so there there is intention to I I think look holistically at this overall section of Oakland. Um, the there are a lot of pieces in play here and there are pieces across the street. And I think um, we have taken sort of a larger view as to how this piece fits into a larger Oakland plan. Um, right now, uh, we are working with the university and uh, Pitt will eventually be buying this. But I mean, this is step one and probably a 25 or 30 step process to looking at how that whole area um, can be thought of. And, and we have been actively monitoring and participating in the community plans and discussions that are going on. So step one of 25 at this point. Great, so there's plenty more process to come, but in the meantime, the um, danger of these properties will be eliminated by the demolition. Correct. Um, and Audio now unmuted. The parcel that's just behind this parcel, that's a property that's owned by the city and is a parklet. Yes, that's Zulema Parklet um, that you certainly, if you've driven down the boulevard, you're familiar, it's sort of a triangular piece that sits in front of uh, the old Isley's building and uh, the Quality Inn piece. Um, and there's no plans at, at this point to, to make any changes to that. It's just on our side of the uh, rusted fence. Dick, did you have a question? Is it okay if I go ahead? Yes, go ahead, Holly. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, is any consideration being given to the uh, Oakland Community Development Plan, uh, at least the 2025 year one, uh, about um, having locally owned affordable housing to accommodate people who work in the Oakland area rather than having uh, large buildings being built on this property? So the, the answer to that is it's too early. Yes, there's consideration being given as, as we look at this and, and many other pieces, but um, right now we're trying to put all the pieces together and, and to think that through. And you know, this discussion is going to be a multiple year process, but certainly what we're calling walk to work housing um, and uh, that type of affordable and accessible uh, type housing for people who live in Oakland is something that's on the drawing board and I know has been discussed in multiple times uh, in various Oakland meetings. So right now we're just talking about demo, but yeah, Commissioner Dick, you know, certainly those issues are being taken into account as, as we start this process of thinking through this. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Nope. Okay, thank you. We'll see you in two weeks. Uh, commissioners, that ends the briefing portion of the meeting. We will uh, go on recess. It's 3.03 .03 right now until 3.15 when we'll start with the hearing portion of our meeting. Thank you.
Alta, audio now and music. I guess is it on the other side? All right, thanks, commissioners. Glad to have you all back. Okay, let me just do a count here. If I could do a sound check for folks, um, please. Uh, actually, let me call to order first. So, welcome everybody to the hearing portion of the Planning Commission meeting for the 13th of July, 2021. Um, Hearing means that the cases are presented for action by the Planning Commission. During the hearing portion of the commission meeting, we will take public testimony. I will give you instructions after each uh, item is heard. Um, welcome to our applicants who are presenting. A reminder to clearly present which slide, uh, it, please clearly describe which slide you are presenting to so that you can assist those who are participating via audio. So uh, let's do a Roll call attendance. Uh, Commissioner Askey. Audio now unmuted. Here. Okay, Commissioner Blackwell. Here. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Brown. Okay, Commissioner Burton Falk. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Dietrich. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Dick. Here. Commissioner Mingo. Here. Hey, Commissioner Mondor here and Commissioner O'Neill here. Okay, thank you. So I will start with our agenda. We have uh, five items on the agenda today. I'll read through all five. We have uh, approval of commission minutes, correspondence, hearing and action, um, plan of lots, and director's reports. We begin with approval of commission minutes. Commissioners, we are in receipt of minutes from our previous meeting. I believe that was the 30th of June. Uh, assuming that you have read those minutes and have forwarded any changes, do I have a motion to approve? So move, Commissioner Blackwell. Thank you. Do I have a second? The, uh, Commission, oh, no, Commissioner Mondor, yeah. I think that's the 29th. Oh, thank you. Thank you. 29th. Sorry. 
Thank you very much for the 29th. So move Commissioner Blackwell, do I have a second? Second, second Commissioner O'Neill. Thank you, Commissioner O'Neill. Okay, I'll do a roll call. Commissioner Askey? Abstain. Commissioner Blackwell? Aye. Commissioner Brown, Commissioner Burton Falk? Aye. Commissioner Dietrich? Abstain. Commissioner Dick? Aye. Commissioner Mingo? Aye. Commissioner Mondor, aye. And Commissioner O'Neill? Aye. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to items. Oh, Chair Mondor, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we did also have an amendment to the June 1st Planning Commission minutes that was sent around last week. And those were previously approved, so it's an amendment post approval. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we'll take that for the record. Thank you, uh, commissioners. It's now on the record uh, a receipt of those minutes. So, okay, uh, items of correspondence. Uh, please be patient while I manage some windows here. I believe we're only in receipt of one item of correspondence. Is that true? At least on the list, I only see one. No, here they are. Okay, sorry, it just takes a while to load. There we go. Now we're in receipt of many items of correspondence as I thought. Okay, uh, related to DCP, MPZC 2019-00584, the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary IMP. We're in receipt of correspondence from Stephanie Walsh, President, Highland Park Community Council. Um, related to DCP, CDR 2019-00563, address 3112 Smallman Street, in receipt of correspondence from Chris Watts, Strip District Neighbors, and Ryan Indovina. Regarding DCP, CDR 2021-06286, address 3401 Bates Street, we're in receipt of correspondence from Camille Kukor and Kathleen Raddock, Oakland Planning and Development Corporation. And regarding stormwater code zoning text change, we're in receipt of correspondence from Mark Birnott, Gerald Steele, David Ho, and Raymond Tristano. Okay. Chair Mondor, yes. just I want to make sure that we do things procedurally correct. Can we, um, would you be able to take a motion on the amended minutes? Sure. Cool. Yep. Thank you for that. Yep. Uh, commissioners, as uh, previously stated, we have uh, received changes to previously approved minutes and we will take a vote to uh, approve the uh, revised minutes. Um, so moved. So moved, Commissioner Mingo. Do I have a second? Second. Second, second Commissioner Dick. Okay, Commissioner Askey. Aye. Commissioner Blackwell. Aye. Commissioner Burton Falk. Aye. Commissioner Dietrich. Aye. Commissioner Dick. Aye. Commissioner Mingo. Aye. Commissioner Mondor abstain. Commissioner O'Neill. Aye. Okay, thank you. Okay, that takes us to items for hearing and action. We have two items under hearing and action. I'll read through both. Uh, item one is DCP ZDR 2021-06780. 20 Stanwick Street, new high wall signs, central business district neighborhood. And item two is stormwater code updates, zoning code text amendment, proposed zoning code text amendment related to stormwater. We'll begin with item one, DCP ZDR 2021-06780, address 20 Stanwick Street, new high wall signs, Ms. Kramer. I will be recusing before Ms. Kramer starts. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. I am Ann Kramer with the uh, Department of City Planning. This is, as Chair Mondor said, DCP ZDR 2021-06780. This is an application for two high wall signs at 20 Stanwood Street. Um, this is a 21 story building at the intersection of Fort Pitt Boulevard and Stanwood Street. Both signs are uh, inter internally illuminated and will be installed at the mechanical level, which is the 13th story of this building. One will be facing the northwest towards downtown and the other will be on the south facing the Mon River. Both are 404 square feet, which is 2% of their respective facades um, as allowed by the code. 
The registered community organization in this area is the Pittsburgh Downtown Partnership, and they hosted the development activities meeting for this application on June 10th of 2021. The report for that is with the staff report for this application. Uh, staff design review had no comments on, the, uh, on this application, and I will turn our attention back over to John Withrow with Colano Design. And Bill Colano is here. And Bill Colano here. is here too. Thank you. As many of you might have seen on uh, recent TV ads, Dollar Bank has a new a logo. Uh, it's shown on this screen, and they're moving to a new headquarters on 20 Stanwick Street. They will be the signature tenant in this building. Next image. The building is on the corner of Stanwick Street at the Mon River and falls within the GTC, uh, which is the Golden Triangle Subdistrict C Zoning District. Next. There are two buildings, two signs proposed on the building. Uh, one faces the Mon River, uh, which is at the bottom of the page, and one face faces uh, Northwest, which is at the top of the drawing. Next. Uh, this building has had two previous high wall signs on it, one for National City Bank and then PNC Bank. At the moment, the signage is down in preparation for Dollar Bank's logo. The sign will be in the same location on the 13th floor mechanical space as the previous signs. Next image. The building facades are both identical and 2%, which is what code allows, gives us 404 square feet for the signs. And they will be placed in a similar uh, height on the building. Next slide. The signs technically 51 feet wide by almost eight feet high. Next. And that size sign can be seen from uh, this radius. And they are similar to the other size signs that were previously on the building. So we have a good view from uh, Mount Washington and some uh, inward city views. Next. Some environmental renderings. The uh, dollar bank sign will be illuminated in blue light as a regular plan of action. It will have the capability of uh, changing colors and two solid uh, pink for Valentine's Day, green for St. Patrick's Day, as many of the other signs in the skyline and will follow the city's uh, luminance ordinance. Next, some additional views showing other signs in the skyline so that you can see the context of size of this uh, sign to others that you might see in the same snapshot. Next. The Northwest facing signs, again, identical placement on the facades. And last, the signs will have a face on them and we're using a very ingenious uh, clipping mechanism, which is shown on the uh, bottom of the sign. They will be state-of-the-art um, LED, and uh, once again, will be dimmable, and we'll be able to change colors, no animation on special occasions. That's our presentation. Okay. Thank you for that. At this time, we do take public testimony. Is there anyone who would like to speak with regards to this application? Uh, no hands are raised at this time. Thank you. Are there questions or comments from the commission? Okay, hearing none, do I have a motion to approve as stated in our report? I move. Thank you, Commissioner Dietrich. Second. Second, Commissioner Raskin. Thank you. Okay, uh, roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Raskin. Hi. Hi. Uh, Burton Falk. Hi. Dietrich. Hi. Dick. Hi. Mingo. Hi. Mondor. Hi. O'Neill is uh, uh, recused. Okay.
Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you. That takes us to item two, which is stormwater codes update, stormwater code updates, zoning code text amendment for the proposed zoning code text amendment related to stormwater. And that is Ms. Vettestone. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, uh, Andrew Dash, city planning director. Um, Marty Vettestone, our principal environmental planner and I will be presenting changes to um, to the city's zoning code uh, relative to stormwater management, um, as um, you know, as Marty will give an overview of you know of these changes. Most of these are a removal of provisions out of Title IX out of the zoning code, uh, which the Planning Commission would make a recommendation on. Um, but given that many of these changes are moving these provisions of the city's code to Title XIII, uh, a, the stormwater title of the city's code, um, we are going to discuss. Uh, many of the, you know, where many of those changes are occurring in Title 13 as well for context to the commissioners, as well as, uh, you know, just because of the commissioner's role in reviewing and stormwater management plans as a part of uh, project development plans and other, uh, other plans that come before the commission. Do we have the presentation up? Thank you. And if we go to the next slide, um, the, the stormwater code update is really focused around uh, around development and development activities. And so, um, you know, PwC and city planning have been conducting the stormwater code update project uh, relative to developers when they're looking to, uh, you know, to develop properties. Um, I'll, you know, we'll talk about the, you know, the future code requirements. Uh, one of the things that you know, want to, to be clear about is just that um, the majority of these changes really do affect uh, people that would have to do stormwater management plans as part of development. So those would be projects that disturb uh, 10,000 square feet or more of land or creating 5,000 square feet or more of new impervious areas. So, it, you know, if, if, if a project isn't meeting those thresholds, uh, there would be no change uh, that would be seen to uh, those property owners. Um, you know, the, we back in 2019 did take to the commission and city council uh, updates relative to the county's uh, Act 167 plan, uh, which is uh, stormwater, you know, stormwater planning at the state level. Uh, we have hired a consultant on the pro this project, AKRF, and, you know, hired them based on their experience with the Philadelphia Water Department uh, and with others. Next slide, please. So again, as I noted, um, the the re the objective uh, here of this project was to move all of the city stormwater or almost all of the city stormwater requirements into one place into Title 13. Um, we did want to create changes to the code uh, and, and you know and, and increase um, some of the requirements around stormwater and stormwater management. Uh, so th those will be, like I said, primarily in changes to Title 13 of the code. Um, we will, you know, and are developing new technical resources around stormwater. So there will be a new stormwater design manual that will be created uh, and uh, associated updates to work, you know, to work that PwCA already has with their developer's manual. And we'll be, and we are working to improve process as a part of this as well. And we'll talk through that. Next slide, please. So where we are in this process, uh, we are really at the, uh, you know, at, at the implementation side of this process in that we are coming to the commission for uh, hearing and recommendation on changes to Title IX to the zoning code. Um, then after that, we will be introducing this legislation to city council and scheduling a public hearing, you know, before city council as well, which, you know, is anticipated to happen in the August to September timeframe. Uh, and then would be taking these code, the code require the code changes both in Title IX and in Title 13 to City Council uh, after there is a public hearing. Next slide, please. And so, you know, just, you know, uh, this slide really kind of, you know, shows a lot of the things that have been done in this process to date. Um, so, you know, doing an assessment of the, the existing code, the, the guidance that we give, um, tying this to things like our MS4 permit um, that we have to do as a, as a city, um, 
looking and taking a, a deeper dive into you know the the development approvals that we've given and how stormwater has played a role in that um, we have done a series of public input uh, processes as well uh, which i know that we'll have more on in future slides and then uh, created a series of policy memos and technical uh, technical analysis and then have come to you now with uh, these changes to code uh, next slide please and so as a part of that engagement, um, we did have both an agency working group, which really covered all of the departments, uh, whether in the city or outside of the city, that do have a review role relative to uh, stormwater and stormwater's role in the development process for new development. Um, so this is the health department, the conservation district, PWSA, and then various city departments, uh, as well as meeting with a series of engineers, developers, community organizations, and architects, people that are involved in stormwater in some way in the development process. So whether that is that are those are people that are working for developers and applicants on the development side, or people that are responding to that on uh, the community side, on the advocacy side, um, having those those groups all together um, to be able to talk about, you know, the the opportunities for code change, and th those, you know, both of those working groups then obviously informed uh, the pro the provisions that we are bringing to uh, the commission today. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, the current stormwater regulations uh, you know, that we're talking about before the commission specifically are those that are in Title IX in the city zoning code. Um, there are a number of, you know, we did have to mail notice to everyone that is in one of these three watersheds, the Monongahela River watershed, the Gertie's Run watershed, and the Squaw Run watershed, because in those three areas, there were uh, stormwater overlay, there was a stormwater overlay district in the zoning code that required different release rates or different, different provisions uh, as development occurred in those districts. Um, in addition, uh, when, with, the, uh, with the initiation of the performance point system, uh, there have been some changes that have been made more recently uh, in areas like Uptown and the Riverfront zoning districts that have created opportunities for increased density or location of a building uh, you know, relative to per performance points that they can get some of those, one of those being relative to rainwater. In, in addition, and I know Marty will talk about this more because uh, you know we are talking about uh, actually eliminating this this provision. Is uh, there were standards in those two zoning districts uh, for what was called small project stormwater standards that required stormwater planning of you know of built you know of buildings and improvements of smaller you know of lower thresholds. Um, however, due to the, you know, the technical analysis as a part of this work, uh, which, like I said, Marty will speak to more, uh, we determined that it was infeasible to continue uh, keeping those regulations. Next slide. And, you know, so now what I'll do is turn it over to Marty, who will talk around uh, the key changes to Title IX and the corresponding changes that we're looking to make to Title 13 of the code to improve uh, stormwater management as a part of these code changes. Marty? Thanks, Director Dash. Yeah, so I you know, want to keep it focused um, on this slide on Title IX and um, the, the proposed changes that are being presented uh, for Planning Commission um, to make a recommendation on, and that is relocating those Act 167 overlay districts to Title 13. Uh, the Title IX changes also include eliminating the small project stormwater standards, adjusting the rainfall performance points um, to better match what will be proposed as the baseline stormwater requirement, um, adding necessary references to Title 13 in the stormwater design manual in the language of Title IX, mm -hmm. clarifying the difference between the riverfront zoning district riparian buffer zone and the riparian requirements uh, related to stormwater. And then just making sure that um, all of the coordination and cross-referencing between other code sections, um, you know, is, is uh, made more efficient and clean. Next slide. So one of the things that uh, at briefing, the commissioners, you know, seem to want to see was basically just, all right, if you're pulling something from Title IX, 
where is it going and you know what's what's going to live in title 13 so i just wanted to show what will you know follow a similar structure of title 13 um, that currently exists but um, you know what will be included so um, in title 13 the threshold for stormwater management requirements as director dash said uh, it's being proposed that it stay the same for projects that are disturbing 10,000 square feet of land or if they're below that threshold, but creating 5,000 square feet of new impervious, um, that is when the stormwater management requirements would be applicable. Um, and so Title 13 would outline all of that as well as exemptions. Title 13, as it does now, would include, you know, the information for the volume and rate controls and under rate controls is where the Act 167 release rates that we're taking from Title IX, this is where they would be. In addition to the proposed public health and safety release rate areas, and the requirement would just be, you know, whichever, um, whichever is highest if they're overlapping. Title 13 would also include, you know, the, the procedural steps for submission of stormwater management plans, um, in addition to the administrative changes, such as um, proposed incentive waivers and providing some more clarity on demonstrating technical and feasibility. Um, additionally, I know Commissioner O'Neill had asked about appeals and things like that, and all of that um, would be outlined in Title 13 as well. Next slide. In addition to Title 13, you know, being codified, the Stormwater Design Manual um, would be a supplemental document that we really want to make sure, um, you know, is a resource to those who are navigating the stormwater management requirement process. Um, we know through our engagement that sometimes the different permits, both inside and outside the city, is unpredictable. Um, they're not always quite sure you know, what the city would prefer given, you know, certain situations. And so the stormwater design manual would provide an overview of all the regulations and requirements. Um, as you can see from the example graphic on the side um, from the Philly stormwater design manual, it would essentially, you know, be help developers and architects and engineers understand what the requirements um, of their specific site are given you know, various metrics. And um, there would also be a lot of site design uh, recommendations, design strategies, um, you know, stormwater best management practices, both non-structural and structural. And then a lot more detail provided about the process and, you know, guidance for submission. Um, there would also be construction guidance and guidance for operation and maintenance. Um, so that would live in the stormwater design manual outside of the code. Next slide. Um, so again, as Director Dash said, you know, we kind of want to scope out to give you a bigger picture of, you know, what this Title IX change is a part of um, in the larger scheme. And so, um, you know, we've, we've gone over the Title 13 recommendations. And so I'll be hitting a few of those and the ones that are related to Title IX are highlighted in blue squares. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is just a summary um, of some of the process improvements that are being proposed that I'll go over. So a two-step um, review and approval process um, to again, help better standardize when that stormwater management plan approval is occurring in the larger de development review. Um, improving coordination with the Allegheny County Health Department Plumbing Code and Permit, um, clarifying some land operation permit requirements, again, eliminating the small project stormwater standards, um, and then, uh, you know, some of these analysis for the public health and safety rates. Next slide. The two-step approval process that's being proposed would involve a conceptual review and then a final technical review. And so, um, as we've said, the conceptual review would need to occur before a project um, could present um, to planning commission. And so we think that that would help a lot with, uh, you know, planning commission seeing things and having to either, um, you know, make recommendations 
with stormwater maybe being a condition of those. And so hopefully that would, um, you know, just create a lot more standardization about where the stormwater management review is when projects are coming to planning commission. Next slide. Uh, again, this is uh, related to Title IX. So we're proposing the elimination of the small project stormwater standard. Currently projects in the uptown public realm and riverfront zoning districts for projects that are disturbing between 500 and 5,000 square feet, a small project stormwater standard is required. And uh, you know, through some of the analysis, we have found that the smaller BMPs um, are a lot more expensive to build and maintain and aren't necessarily, um, you know, contributing to reducing runoff um, in the way that we maybe were hoping. And so um, we're proposing the elimination of this additionally because um, we know that for some projects in that size, um, it can be a little burdensome um, to hire an engineer or things like that. Um, so that's one of the Title IX changes that is being proposed. Next slide. Uh, for um, climate change, we are looking to call for the utilization of a climate projection model for um, design of the stormwater management, um, best management practices. So of the facilities that are managing stormwater. Um, you know, as we can see in the past couple weeks, we know that rain events are intensifying, um, becoming more frequent. And so we wanna ensure that the requirements that we're putting in place will actually help um, you know, address a lot of these problems that come with those more intense storms um, to reduce flooding and the basement backups that we know affect homeowners all over the city. Um, and so that is one of the, the proposals um, in Title 13. Next slide. In addition, um, in terms of trying to address flooding, um, and other health and safety issues. Uh, there was an analysis done of the combined sewer watersheds and um, you know, places that we know consistently flood um, and what the sewer capacity is in those areas. Um, and so in blue are the Act 167 release rate requirements. And so those would stay, they would just be moved from Title IX to Title 13. Um, and then the orange, um, demonstrates the watersheds that we know have um, these flooding um, issues more frequently. And so looking to establish release rate requirements for those areas as well that help address some of those issues in those watersheds and sewer sheds. Next slide. And then on the administrative side, um, providing waivers um, and you know, for expedited reviews for projects such as affordable housing, small business, MWBE businesses, um, you know, things that, that we want to, you know, to, to see happen. And um, we know that sometimes re longer review times uh, cost money. And so, you know, really looking to, um, to provide kind of a, a expedited review for those applicants. Next slide. Um, in addition, we also know that, you know, a lot of the stormwater uh, facilities that we see in developments now are almost exclusively underground. And while those might, you know, be effective in um, detaining the stormwater, we know that having surface vegetative components, um, water reuse and things like that provide a lot of co-benefits. Um, for developments and for people that, that interact with those. Um, you know, so having some sort of surface vegetation that maybe accompanies a subsurface uh, BMP. Um, and so we would have, um, and this would all be in the stormwater design manual, um, but basically uh, incentives for um, a, an expedited review for projects that are achieving, you know, these things that we know are more desirable. Next slide. Uh, additionally, uh, there currently is not a lot of guidance on establishing technical and feasibility for managing stormwater in, um, on site. And so there would just, the 
um, you know, we're proposing a, a rubric that would uh, better outline that criteria and provide clear guidance on, um, you know, if a site is not technically feasible uh, to manage the stormwater on site and that they'd be seeking an in lieu fee. And I know that um, at the last, at the last uh, briefing, it was, you know, mentioned about the financial hardship and um, that would not be um, a piece of this criteria as currently proposed. Next slide. Um, so if, if there are site conditions that would deem a site, you know, technically infeasible to manage stormwater on site, uh, frequently that's contaminated soils, uh, this would establish an in-lieu fee um, that would better reflect the full um, life cycle of a stormwater system um, that would be paid to the Stormwater Management Trust Fund um, and you know, currently the language that's uh, part of the alternative compliance fee does not include maintenance. Um, and there's, you know, other, other shortcomings like that, that, uh, you know, we want to, to rectify by having more guidance on this in lieu fee. Next slide. Audio now unmuted. Um, so again, this is just a summary of some of those um, kind of more administrative changes that are being proposed in Title 13, which again, um, are not part of the Title IX um, changes that are being proposed right now. Uh, but really, it's all in an effort to, one, it provide more clarity and predictability for those who are navigating the stormwater management requirement process. Um, additionally, to have, you know, have standards that that better address stormwater management, as we know that um, it can be such a, a tough issue for so many homeowners and property owners and residents across the city. Um, and just having more desirable stormwater management practices and finding a way to incentivize those um, through the development review process. Next slide. So just bringing it back to Title IX, um, you all have the, the proposed changes, but this is just um, sort of an excerpt of, you know, the example of the administrative changes that are being proposed um, to remove all 906 um, content into Title 13, those overlays, um, and adjust the bonus points to better be going above and beyond what will be the standard of all stormwater management requirements. Um, so if those projects are looking to receive bonus points, um, restructuring this guarantees that they are going um, above and beyond to get those points. Next slide. Director Dash, you wanna take us out? Sure. Uh, so, so uh, you know, we're, we're here to ask for your recommendation relative to those Title IX zoning ch change amendments. Um, like I said before, we will be um, after this uh, you know, after the planning commission renders a recommendation, uh, then submitting the amended code to city council uh, that will <laughs> have changes to not only the zoning code, but those changes to the stormwater code that Marty alluded to, as well as some changes in title four of the city's code, which is around public places and property, um, you know, as well. So um, we anticipate that that public hearing, which would, we, we would be accompanying that with a notice to uh, to property owners who received one already. They would be getting a second notice uh, that that public hearing before city council would take place in the August to September timeframe is when we we assume. Uh, so, so again, um, you know, this is kind of the package of amendments uh, to the stormwater code that really do affect uh, development and developers. And so, you know, again, you know, trying to, um, you know change the regulations, update the regulations uh, relative to that. And that, you know, so that, you know, there are some, you know, these changes will um, increase the way that, you know, increase the amount and the rate of stormwater and how that is handled. Uh, so although, you know, re you know, residents, uh, you know, residents of, of standard size lots in the city of Pittsburgh, this may not apply to them. Uh, the way that it would apply would be that, you know, since developers and applicants would be, would have a, an increased responsibility around stormwater, uh, the hope is that it would, you know, 
on its own, you know, start to affect, um, you know, management of stormwater, uh, you know, as a system. So thank you. Uh, and yeah, obviously we're able to take any questions that commissioners may have after public testimony. Great, thank you very much. This time we do take public testimony. If you'd like to speak with regards to this item, please raise your hand and you'll be brought into the room. There will be a delay as you are being brought into the room. And when you come in, you can state your name, any organization you represent, and then you have three minutes. Uh, is there anyone who would like to speak with regards to this project? Uh, we do have hands raised. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, I'm Maria Levick, you're unmuted. Yeah, hi. Um, from what I'm understanding on this, this is going to affect a lot of what PWSA had uh, proposed to us about two years ago. And um, they wanted to put these above ground vegetation, which are bio gardens on our streets. They wanted to dig up a considerable part of Point Breeze and put in underground uh, storage. And from what I've been informed, these changes, originally we were able to oppose PWSA from doing this. If we agree to these changes, are we gonna lose that right and the city of Pittsburgh can make those decisions for us? Okay, so thank you for that testimony. Sorry, I interrupt, but anybody who speaks, I need them to identify themselves. Okay, I'm sorry, this is Emery Levick. I live at 203 South Linden Avenue in Point Breeze. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emery. So to those of you who might be here for the first time, um, uh, during public testimony, you're free to ask questions, make comments. Um, there's no back and forth, so you won't get an answer at that moment, but the planning commission will take notes and ask the folks who are here presenting um, to speak to the concerns that we heard during public testimony. So when you do come into the room, state your name, any organization you represent and your address, any questions or comments you have, um, we're taking notes and um, after everybody's done presenting, we'll get to uh, people's concerns. So thank you for that, Emery. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rebecca El Hasid, you're unmuted. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Rebecca El Hasid. I live at 1956 Beechwood Boulevard in Squirrel Hill. Um, and I was speaking to a lot of my neighbors about this postcard we got. And I heard the presentation here, but I think what a lot of us are concerned about is that this is a first step down a road that is going to eventually lead to requiring us to retrofit our houses. And I know online there's a lot of comments that reflect the same thing. And I know that this specific um, change that you're trying to make is not doing that. But I think that there is, we are unclear on who we can talk to about that, who is accountable for that. We're hearing horror stories about people who lost their whole investment in their home because they were told that before sale, they had to pass a die test. Our house is built on this hill. It was built, you know, well before anybody considered anything along these lines. And I think that a lot of us are looking for a clear understanding and path that goes beyond this, but goes, you know, down the road to what is the next step? Is there a plan to do something like that? What is the timing around that plan? How are we as homeowners supposed to cope with it? So I think a lot of the questions that my neighbors and I have, and I've spoken with many of the people who live along my block are, you know, how is this, how is this going to affect us in the future? What is this a step towards? Thank you, Rebecca. Kathleen, it might be possible or helpful if you know who's after, who's on deck after the person who's in the room, that way they know that they're next. Um, and we know who's coming. If you could just say, say the name of who's coming in and then who's next. Great, yeah, I can do that. Uh, Gordon Davidson, you're unmuted now. John, you're on deck. Hi, my name is Gordon Davidson. I live in Knoxville at 332 Avenue, or Brownsville Avenue. And my affiliation is with the Mount Washington Community Development Corporation. I've already received some inquiries from members in my community and I keep on thinking about other ways these proposed changes can affect development within Mount Washington and Duquesne Heights. And I have a number of questions that I hope will be addressed later on. They're not too difficult. I look at the overlay maps and I'm wondering how they key into an existing geographic map of the same scale that I could find because I've got an inquiry about that. Um, 
it would be really interesting or nice to see how the non-administrative elements of the proposed change actually apply and possibly make it more difficult to apply or comply with stormwater control measures. I'm confused, but no, in the same manner of speaking, it would be nice to see what happens when you're, you hit that 10,000 square foot level or that 5,000 square foot level. And they, I might have just duplicated my prior question. Um, it looks like the, in lieu of in lieu of fee prices, price out smaller developers, and that's a big concern up on the mountain. And there's text about preferred stormwater management technology. I'd like to know how that was selected because I used to work on air control uh, measures and talking about backed and racked and things like that. And I'm done. Great, thank you. Okay, this is uh, John Oldershaw. I live at 7153 Roycrest Place in uh, Point Breeze. And I'm gonna just echo the same question that one of our previous guests raised, and that is, you know, is there gonna be uh, a requirement to retrofit plumbing in, in, the, in my current home? Because I'm concerned that if that's the case, um, it's an expensive proposition and may cause issues in terms of selling a home. So that, that's basically my sentiment. And um, I think the question was previously asked. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Jennifer Thomas, you're unmuted. Bill Hoffman, you're up next. Yeah, I think uh, that is John Stephen. Um, can you hear me? Just, yeah, okay. It's John Stephen. I'm the uh, coordinator for the Negley Run Watershed Task Force. And I just uh, want to commend uh, the Planning Commission for getting this uh, in the Planning Department staff for its work on this process. I mean, clearly it's um, an important subject and this is just the first step in a lot of community dialogue around uh, stormwater. And uh, you know, just to remind people that the city is under a consent decree to eliminate its uh, sewer overflows and another consent agreement to manage, uh, to better manage its stormwater. So this is a good start. I know there'll be a lot of uh, questions and uh, we'll have some good dialogue. I do wanna specifically mention, uh, compliment them on using um, climate change projections is that clearly that is an important element uh, and I'm not sure too many other municipalities have taken that step. So I think that's a good, a good thing to recognize and to, uh, to integrate. Uh, and also um, I'm intrigued and uh, applaud the uh, health and safety rate opportunities. I'm not sure how that will be uh, implemented, but I think as um, you know, basement flooding and localized flash flooding is clearly a public health issue. And I think those uh, rate flow uh, standards um, might find a way to, to help that, to address that on a community basis and a watershed basis. So thank you for getting this process started and I uh, look forward to uh, future uh, public discussions about it. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Bill Hoffman, you're unmuted. Yes, uh, this is Dr. Hoffman, 111 South Linden Avenue. Uh, several years ago, uh, I went to several presentations by the PWSA with regard to uh, rejigging the uh, stormwater situation on Linden Avenue. And uh, a number of us were in attendance and we were opposed to it then. And I don't see any reason why we still wouldn't be opposed to it. Linden Avenue is, is really one of the nicer streets in Point Breeze and, and I saw nothing but uh, negative, uh, a, ch a negative change in the appearance to the way Linden would look after these proposed water reservoirs were uh, uh, put in place. So I'm just voting against this as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. We don't have any other hands raised at this time. Okay, great, thank you. 
Uh, commissioners, are there questions or comments? It, before uh, commissioners ask questions, since we're taking public testimony, um, uh, Marty, I wonder if you could just summarize, you answered a lot of questions on the city's website. And I wonder if you could just summarize some of the themes that you answered there and the types of questions that you had. I'm sorry, we just had some hands go up after uh, after saying that uh, there weren't any. Okay, let's uh, let's hold on 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 hearing Ms. Battistone's, um testimony and let's take. Uh, I, I will make a last call. I think we have two more people who have signed up. If you think you want to speak, please raise your hand now because uh, otherwise, once we close public testimony, we don't go back to it. So we'll reopen it. If you want to speak, please raise your hand now. Uh, all right, Emma Pipkin, you should be unmuted or able to unmute yourself. Emma, we cannot hear you and it looks like you're muted. Are you able to unmute yourself? Kathleen, why don't we go to the next speaker yeah. and then we can come back. Okay. Uh, Karen, you should be unmuted. Karen, it looks like you are unmuted. It doesn't look like you're muted. Can you can you hear us? And if so, can you uh, want to say something and see if we can hear you? <laughs> okay, let's hold on those two. Let's go to the next one. And if uh, Karen or Emma come back around, we'll be happy to hear your testimony. Uh, okay, Mo Dolly, you should be unmuted. Hi, um, I'm really glad we're trying to address stormwater issues. It's a serious, serious problem, especially where I live in Squirrel Hill South, 5643 Melvin Street, um, and uh, adjoining streets like Whiteman and um, Murray. Um, the thing, I'm not sure if I can contest or uh, make testimony to whether this is right or wrong. Um, the thing that really concerns me is, is that residents, I don't under, I don't think understand the, the severity of this, of the stormwater problem and how we can educate um, residents to uh, design their landscapes so that there's less water runoff. Um, it seems as though that ought to be something that we incorporate into the plan in some way um, I don't know how that would be done, um, but all I see is people, you, there used to be um, berms on, on the edges of the streets. Um, most people are just, um, are cementing those over. And so, you know, one house after the other, which is, it's really exceeds 5,000 feet. So um, that's what I'm concerned about. I would, um, how can we educate people to design their landscape so that there's less water runoff. Thank you. Thank you, Mo. Uh, do we have someone else coming in? We do. Uh, Giuseppe Scalamona, you, you should be unmuted. Hello, this is Emma Pipkin. Can you hear me? Emma, we can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, my name is Emma Pipkin, and I'm concerned about the property at 2056 Swiss Vail Avenue in the East Hills um, area. It is a vacant lot, so please tell me how it would be affected by this new ruling and moving 
everything to this new title nine. Emma, thank you for that question and we'll make sure that, um, that we can get answers for you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for, thanks for testifying. Uh, do we have Giuseppe or Karen? We have both of you available to speak if you can. Um, I would encourage you, if you have access to uh, the, the Q&A, you could put your question in there and we'll um, ask it uh, as your testimony. We okay. have no additional hands raised in okay. the attendees list. Okay, uh, Kathleen, I, we're going to close public testimony, but if either of them are able to get through, we will hear their testimony. Okay. So thank you. Okay, thank you for everybody who uh, did testify at this time. Now we um, have questions and comments from the commissioners, and I will uh, uh, ask again, Ms. Battistone, to just talk about the public questions you saw on the website. Yeah, thank you. So I would say the majority of questions um, reflected Ms. Pipkin's uh, question just about generally how will this impact um, their property. Um, and again, I you know I, I do want want to apologize if the the postcard was confusing. It was um, you know obviously a, we were legally required to send it for all property owners in those watersheds um, that that were technically impacted by Title IX, um, and so. The short answer is that this won't really affect, um, you know, the average homeowner unless they're doing development projects that disturb 10,000 square feet um, or more, or are creating 5,000 square feet of new impervious surface. Um, and so, it's with those thresholds that these requirements would would kick in, um, and then you know you would in the development review process be required to manage the stormwater. Um, indirectly, we hope that ultimately, um, as the city, you know, updates its stormwater code, that you will see a reduction in basement backups and flooding and, um, you know, indirectly see a benefit from um, these development standards. Um, and then I think some other common, there I think is a lot of uh, kind of, I think the, the question about private laterals, um, what did pop up a handful of times as well. Um, and especially um, if you know, anything we're proposing would include needing to disconnect your downspout at the point of sale um, that is not being proposed in, you know, in these, these co-changes um, for Title 13, Title 4, um, or Title 9. Um, and so, um, yeah, just wanna kind of clarify that. I think, um, I hope that all of you um, you know, on the call can access the Engage PGH site. There's, you know, well over 50 questions that might, that have been answered that might, you know, be exactly your question. And so hopefully you can find um, some answers there as well. Um, there were a lot of questions that sort of blurred over into the PWSA um, stormwater fee conversation. So again, you know, as it's been said, this is definitely a a really topical issue. Um, we know there's a lot happening both at the city and, you know, PWSA. And so um, this is, is separate from the, the stormwater fee conversation, but it is related insofar that, you know, if, if the development met the stormwater plan, stormwater requirements, um, you know, they would hopefully see a, a reduction in any fee because they would be um, better managing their stormwater on site, um, maybe have less impervious surface, things like that. Um, so I, I hope that, that there's no physical work involved in this code change. I think a lot of people 
thought that they were being notified um, that you know there was going to be some sort of physical construction happening um, related to stormwater. That's not the case. Um, this is you know an administrative change. Um, so yeah, I think I think that mostly summarizes um, summarizes the questions that we received on there and hopefully answers um, you know some of the the testimony pieces as well. Um, Marty, if I could just repeat back to you some of the things that uh, you said, um, just to confirm um, that uh, one, this is uh, for public, for private, con is concerned with new development um, and development on sites that are over 10,000 square feet or add 5,000 square feet of impervious surface. So just for everybody's reference, that's a kind of commercial development size and small commercial development size, but commercial development. And most properties in the city are not, do not exceed that amount. So for all the homeowners who signed on to that website and asked questions, it does not affect homeowners in general. It would be an exception if it, I mean, it would be exceptional if it did. Correct. And um, just to add to that, that also elimination of the small stormwater standards which would be the only ones that would affect, um, you know, a homeowner more likely who is adding, you know, a, a parking pad or a deck um, who, would, who would currently, if they were in uptown or the riverfront zoning districts, be subject to those requirements. Um, it's being proposed that those are eliminated. Um, so in theory, you know, it, even if they didn't know that that would have been a requirement, um, they won't be subject. That's great. So what I heard and what I saw in the questions were a lot of anxiety around that, but that's not going to be an issue. What I hear you saying, this also doesn't affect laterals or downspout disconnections, you said. So nobody's being asked to disconnect or anything to do with that. There was also some questions about um, drinking water too. This has nothing to do with PWC and drinking water. This is only storm water. Um, the, uh, and you had said that um, there are other, as you said, there are other agencies, PWSA, doing other things around stormwater fees um, and things that only they can do, and this does not deal with that. So there's obviously many more questions that people have that we can't answer today, um, but uh, there will be um, forums to have those conversations as PWSA is, is developing their work, right? Correct. Right. Yeah. Great. Okay, commissioners, what questions do you have since we've heard from the public and we've heard, we've talked about what's on the website, what questions do you have? Just quickly, it seems like Giuseppe is on. I see his like screen lighting up. Are you able to speak? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please give your testimony of you three minutes and please give your name, your address and any organization you represent. Hey, thank you. So my name is Giuseppe Scalamagna. I'm a resident of South Oakland at 3366 Parkview Avenue. I live here with my wife, Tracy. Um, we've seen some problems with the city sewer uh, backing up several times over the two years that we've lived here. Um, it happened once uh, two years ago, the first summer we lived here. It's happened twice this year with the heavy rains. Uh, each time we've contacted PWSA, uh, they've told us that it is uh, not their issue. We've had plumbers come and clear our lines and tell us that the issue is not on our side. It's clearly a stormwater issue. Um, it's been unsanitary. I know it affects our neighbors. Um, it's been very difficult. So I was actually optimistic when we received this letter thinking that uh, the city sewer would somehow be uh, fixed. I know they're uh, are some individuals worried about the water downspout disconnecting? Uh, you know, that was a concern that I had too, because our, our water, this is a 110 year old home. Our water does run into the sewer storm water is pumped that way as well. Uh, we've seen some of the neighbors disconnect their water from their homes. And if they have concrete rather than grass, it's running over into neighbors' homes and creating you know, uh, swamps in other people's backyards. So I don't know what the ultimate solution to these problems would be, uh, but I know that it's going to need to involve uh, getting creative. And, uh, you know, based on what 
my neighbors are telling me I, this problem is not limited to just our home. So uh, I think that as the climate change problem starts to worsen and this becomes more of an issue, it will need to be addressed. And uh, you know, I'm hopeful that the city will find a way um, to make certain that this sanitation issue is addressed. Yes, thank you, Giuseppe. Glad you could join us. Thank you. And I just uh, ask if Karen's available to speak yet. It doesn't look like it. Karen? Uh, Karen's unmuted. There are also a number of uh, items in the Q&A from, from Karen, I believe. OK, so, great. Can so even if she's not able to speak, we should have many of her uh, comments uh, and testimony in that. Uh, uh, Kathleen, are you able to, uh, to share those? Uh, yes, um, Karen is asking how this will affect her property on the corner of Welfare and Windsor Street. Uh, what is stormwater uh, and that um, the downspouts have been changed to not run into the terracotta piping. Uh, where is the watershed uh, near that home? And if uh, Karen understands correctly, this will not affect her home. And how is this related to dye testing? So Karen, we probably can't um, answer all your questions because some of them are highly specific, but um, we certainly can address some of the general ones. Um, uh, Ms. Patison, can you talk about the relationship to dye testing and um, you know, where this falls into that? Yeah, so I think, you know, that goes back um, to the, you know, as Karen's saying, um, she disconnected from the terracotta piping. Um, so dye testing is all done through PWSA. Um, and um, this, you know, this administrative change will not necessarily um, address that um, because, you, be, you know, because we're not making any mandates about private laterals, um, you know, contributing to the, the larger system. Um, but hopefully, um, if you go online, um, someone else did ask about that on the, the website, and I just provided um, the PWSA dye testing team contact information. Thank you. Commissioners, questions or comments? Thank you, Karen, for sticking it out and trying to uh, reach out. No, none. Uh, so I have a couple, a couple uh, comments is uh, having a chance to review the material during the process. It's an incredibly thorough um, technical assessment um, and it's a very complex set of issues. And so I commend staff uh, in PWSA and both uh, DCP for um, trying to put the right things in the right places and to figure out um, how to um, you know, how to make this process more efficient. I know as planning commission, we have been disappointed when uh, developers are um, resorting to say below grade um, storage as opposed to green infrastructure, which provides green space and habitat. Um, and so we really appreciate things like your sensitivity to that and trying to encourage that um, through some of the incentives. Um, I think also um, trying to align the processes so that by the time projects come to us, they have been reviewed and we have a kind of, uh, sometimes they have come to us and they haven't been reviewed and that makes us be the one that's asking the hard questions. So I think that that's great. Um, I think that looking at in lieu fees that reflect full life cycle cost is a very um, positive thing. Um, and I uh, appreciate kind of fast tracking for preferred uses like affordable housing and small businesses. I think uh, that's great. Um, I think what you, what you hear me saying is as a kind of going down your summary and saying, great, I think these are good things. So these are good. Um, uh, I, uh, I think the, the one, um, I think the one suggestion, thank you for coming back with us and telling us what's in 13. Um, and so that we know that is everything is being caught. Um, I think the one thing that's apparent by the amount of people that we had show up for testimony, and again, I thank everybody who came here, and I appreciate the concern you have about your property and your homes, because we all are dealing with climate change and 
just as you started speaking, Marty, it was like the heavens opened up and I'm watching hurricane force water come down in my property. Um, you know, we're all dealing with new things with relationship to stormwater and it's not apparent to many folks, most of us in fact, kind of how things are changing. And I would encourage both DCP and PWSA to put out educational material that clearly explain what the issues are in our system so that people aren't conflating many different concerns and maybe getting uh, anxious about things that they don't need to be anxious about, but then also knowing when they do need to take action, it's really not clear. And while we might have the regulatory now sorted issues sorted out, in general, the public isn't prepared to know how and when to act. Um, so I highly encourage some sort of joint effort to communicate to the public on climate change, answering these questions that folks have about what about my property, what about this vacant law, um, knowing who to call is half the battle. And just on this, if they received a postcard, they're now going to a website, the DCP, following up with them and telling them where to find certain resources would be helpful and breaking down this kind of complex and highly technical issue. So, um, you know, it's great work done to date. And as we see by the amount of people who've come today, they care about it, but we still have a lot of work to do to make sure that it's communicated and that everybody can kind of walk in step on this one. So. No, I think those are very good points. And I think things for us to consider as we will have to send, you know, the residents who are on this call as well as uh, thousands of others, uh, another postcard when there is a uh, public hearing before city council. So yep. luckily, luckily we'll have had, you know, a number of residents who have asked questions on the website already, and hopefully that will be able to provide some guidance. Um, but since we will have even more material at a city council hearing, uh, I think it means it, it, you know, like you said, makes it all the more imperative that we, um, you know, try to be as clear as we can. Uh, one more comment is I noticed a lot of the folks who came are from communities that maybe folks have time or to kind of educate themselves about stuff or are on top of things. Uh, there's many more communities that are affected by this where folks may not have the time or capacity to participate in this process. So I really encourage you to make sure that we're reaching out to all of our environmental justice communities and neighborhoods. Okay, any other questions or comments, commissioners? Um, the only, thank you, Christine, and thank you, um, uh, Department of City Planning staff who has done a great job with this. Um, I think one of the things, and maybe Marty, you answered this, but just, just for clarity's sakes, the Linden Avenue proposal by PWSA, this, this does not affect PWSA's project or proposals for Linden Avenue in any way. And that's one question. And the second one is that PWSA isn't going to be um, this, these regulatory changes within the city of Pittsburgh code do not directly affect PWSA unless they're building like a development themselves. <laughs> uh, yeah, so- Is that correct? Yeah, to yeah. your question first, um, PWSA, you know, when they're doing um, some of the larger projects like Woods Run, um, Ruby Park, they, you know, they're subject to the stormwater management um, plan, you know, just as, as any development is. Um, and so, you know, I, I review all those. So yes, um, to that. And then, um, yeah, this has nothing to do with the Linden, um, Linden Avenue PWSA project proposal. Um, and I, I can't speak to any details um, about that. Yeah, I mean, that, that project is one of PWS, it, you know, was uh, one of PWSA's projects to do separate green infrastructure uh, projects across the city. And, um, and all of those would have their own, would continue to have their own public process, uh, much like, in much as uh, I believe the one resident of Linden Avenue spoke to uh, when they were giving their testimony. And in fact, for clarity, this is related to private property regulations, not public realm, right? Um, it, it there, it's any, um, it's not public right of way, um, but for instance, like the park projects um, still have to 
go through stormwater management um, review. So even so though it's on public lands, yeah. Okay, so if it was a streetscape, it would not apply. If it was um, a park property or privately owned, it would. Um, yes, there are uh, there are exceptions for the public right of way. Like um, if it's just you know resurfacing, um, you know that is not being the stormwater is not being triggered every time. Um, but if it's you know hitting those thresholds in the public right of way, it would be subject. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Yep. Other questions or comments, Commissioner? All right, so um, I do not have the report in front of me. Are we, is this a recommend approval to city council? Yes, okay. It is, yes, uh, to, to those changes uh, that were in Title IX. Okay, great. So commissioners, do I have a motion to approve that to recommend approval to city council as stated in our report? So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Askey. Second. Second, Commissioner O'Neill. Thank you, Commissioner O'Neill. Okay, uh, Commissioner Askey. Hi. Audio now unmuted. Commissioner Blackwell. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Burton Falk. Aye. Commissioner Dietrich. Oh, she left. Sorry. Commissioner Dick. Aye. Commissioner Mingo. Aye. Commissioner Mondor. Aye. Commissioner O'Neill. Aye. Excellent. Okay, thank you all. And thank you all to uh, folks who came to testify or to listen. Uh, we welcome your, your input. Um, that takes us through hearing and action and we move on to plan of lots. If I understand correctly, uh, we have nine items up uh, for plan of lots and all nine can be batched. Um, I would ask, is there anyone who needs to abstain from any of these and we'll pull them out. Nope, okay, so I'll read through all nine and then we'll hear the reports from Mr. Shepke. Uh, item one is DCP lot 2021 00866, Pius 10 subdivision, major subdivision two, Brookline. Item two is DCP lot 2021 00924, Western Avenue, major consolidation two, Manchester. Item three is DCP lot 2021 00840, 5711 Forward Avenue, Major Lot Line Revision 2, Squirrel Hill South. Item 4 is DCP Lot 2021 00941, address 2246 Brownsville Road, Lot Line Revision, Carrick. Item 5 is DCP Lot 2021 00227, Cassatt Street, Lot Line Revision, Crawford Roberts. Item 6 is DCP Lot 2021 00228, De Villiers Street. Minor Subdivision, Middle Hill. Item seven is DCP lot 2021 00991, address 1104 Pocono, Minor Consolidation, Swiss Helm Park. Item eight is DCP lot 2021 01007, address thir uh, 335, 335 Main Street, Minor Consolidation, Central Lawrenceville. And item nine is DCP lot 2021 01008, 1039 Arlington Avenue, minor consolidation, Allentown. Mr. Shepke. Thank you, Chair Mondor. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the Pius X uh, subdivision. This is the subdivision of two parcels into three parcels. The proposed lot RA1 would have 225 feet of frontage on Pioneer Avenue, 96 feet of frontage on uh, Kenleyworth Avenue, and would be 129,170 square feet in area. The proposed lot B1 would have 78 feet of frontage on Pioneer Avenue, 99 feet of frontage on Waddington Avenue, it would be 5,422 square feet in area. The proposed lot B2 would have 98 feet of frontage on Pioneer Avenue, it would be 8,488 square feet in area. The Pius X Church Campus is on the subject property, and this is a major subdivision which was first reviewed by Planning Commission on May 4th, 2021. Uh, the staff's recommended motion is to approve the Pius X subdivision. The next item on the agenda is the Western Avenue consolidation. This is the consolidation of nine parcels into two parcels. Uh, lot one would have 130 feet of frontage on Fulton Street, 130 feet of frontage on Manhattan Avenue, 385 feet of frontage on Manhattan Avenue, and would be 52,383 square feet in area. 
Uh, lot two would have 119 feet of frontage on Manhattan Avenue. It would be 9,598 square feet in area. Two office buildings and a parking lot are located on the subject property. And this is a major subdivision that was first uh, reviewed by Planning Commission on uh, June 29th, 2021. Uh, and staff's recommended motion is to approve the Western Avenue consolidation. The next item is the 5711 Forward Avenue uh, lot line revision. The proposed lot one would have 520 feet of frontage on Forward Avenue. It would be 52,841 uh, square feet in area. Lot two would have 137 feet of frontage on Forward Avenue and be 12,087 square feet in area. Lot three would have 98 feet, feet of frontage on Pocusset Street, it would be 6,048 square feet in area. An automotive repair business is located on the subject property. And this is a major subdivision which was first reviewed by the Planning Commission on June 29th, 2021. Staff's recommended motion is to approve the 5711 Forward Avenue lot line revision. The next item is the 2246 Brownsville Road lot line revision. This is a lot line revision involving two parcels. Lot one would have 65 feet of frontage on Brownsville Road. It would be 9,619 square feet in area. Lot two would have 60 feet of frontage on Brownsville Road. It would be 11,271 square feet in area. No new parcels are created in this plan and two houses are located on the subject property. Staff's recommended motion is to approve the 2246 Brownsville Road lot line revision. The next item is the Cassatt Street lot line revision. This is a lot line revision involving two parcels. Lot one would have 19.5 feet of frontage on Cassatt Street and it would be 1,101 square feet in area. Lot two would have 19.5 feet of frontage on Cassatt Street and it would be 1,101 square feet in area. No new parcels are created in this plan and the subject property is currently vacant. Staff's recommended motion is to approve the Cassatt Street lot line revision. The next uh, item is a Develier Street subdivision. This is the subdivision of five parcels into eight parcels. Lot 15 would have 23 feet of frontage on Devilliers Street. It would be 2,176 square feet in area. Lot 16 would have 22 feet of frontage on Devilliers Street. It would be 2,081 square feet in area. Lot 17 would have 23 feet of frontage on Devilliers Street. It would be 2,129 square feet in area. Lot 18 would have 23 feet of frontage on Devilliers Street. It would be 2,129 square feet in area. Lot 19 would have 23 feet of frontage on Devilliers Street. It would be 2,129 square feet in area. Lot 20 would have 20 feet of frontage on Devilliers Street. It would be 1,892 square feet in area. Lot 21 would have 23 feet of frontage on Devilliers Street. It would be 2,129 square feet in area. And Lot 22 would have 25 feet of frontage on Devilliers Street. It would be 2,336 square feet in area. The subject property is currently vacant and staff's recommended motion is to approve the Devilliers Street subdivision. The next item is the 1104 Pocono Street consolidation. This is a consolidation of two parcels into one parcel. The lot would have 73 feet of French on Pocono, Pocono Street. It would be 7,040 square feet in area. A house is located on the subject property and staff's recommended motion is to approve the 1104 Pocono Street Consolidation. The next item is the 335 Main Street Consolidation. Uh, lot one would have, the proposed lot would have 34 feet of frontage on Main Street. It would be 2,759 square feet in area. This is the consolidation of three parcels into two parcels. Uh, house is located on the subject property and staff's recommended motion is to, or pardon, it's the consolidation of two parcels into one parcel. And the staff's recommended motion is to approve the 335 Main Street consolidation. Uh, the last item is the 1039 Arlington Avenue consolidation. This is the consolidation of two parcels into one parcel. Uh, the lot would have 50 feet of frontage on Arlington Avenue and be 4,604 square feet in area. A house is located on the subject property and the staff's recommended motion is to approve the uh, 1039 Arlington Avenue consolidation. Uh, that concludes staff reports for Plan of Lots. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Shepke. At this time, we take public testimony. Is there anyone who would like to speak with regards to Plan of Lots, item one through nine? No hands are raised at this time. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so we close public testimony. Is there, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Chair Mondor, um, I will abstain from item two DCP dash lot 2021 dash 00924, but we'll vote on all other items. Okay, great. So do I have a motion to approve items one, three, four, five, six, seven, nine? So moved. Do have a second? Second. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go through. Commissioner Askey? Aye. Commissioner Blackwell? Aye. Commissioner Burton Falk? Aye. Commissioner Dietrich? Oh, no, it's not here, excuse me. It's Commissioner Dick? Aye. Commissioner Mingo? Aye. Commissioner Mondor? Aye. Commissioner O'Neill? Aye. Okay, great. So let's go back and do I have a motion to approve item two, uh, DCP lot 2021-00924? So so Commissioner O'Neill. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, second Commissioner Blackwell. Thank you. Um, roll call uh, vote. Commissioner Askey? Aye. Commissioner Blackwell? Aye. Commissioner Burton Falk? Abstain. Commissioner Dietrich? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Dick? Aye. Commissioner Mingo? Aye. Commissioner Mondor? Aye. Commissioner O'Neill? Aye. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. Is there a director's report? Uh, there is not today, no. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, thank you so much for uh, your attendance, great attendance and your attention today. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, second. All done, leaving menu bar, table view, table view. Okay, second. Audio now unmuted, DCP staff colon Daniel Shetty has left the space. Okay, thanks everybody. Have a good day. Have a good day. Has left the meeting. Thank you, Commissioners. Bye-bye. Thank you. Menu bar. System.